The following is a conversation with Ryan Hall, one of the most insightful minds and systems thinkers in the martial arts world. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu, accomplished competitor, an MMA fighter undefeated in the UFC, and truly a philosopher who seeks to understand the underlying principles of the martial arts. Jiu-jitsu is such an important part of who I am, and I was hoping to share that with folks who might know me only as a researcher. I think there's no better person to do that with than Ryan, who somehow, remarkably, I can say is a friend and also a modern day warrior philosopher of the Miyamoto Masashi line of especially dangerous and brilliant humans. Also, his amazing wife, Jen Hall, was there as well. So if you hear a kind of voice of wisdom coming from above, you know who it is. Quick summary of the sponsors, PowerDot, Babbel, and Cash App. Please check out the sponsors in the description to get a discount and to support this podcast. As a side note, let me say that renaming this podcast to just my name gave me intellectual freedom that I really didn't anticipate was so empowering, especially for someone who's trying to find their voice. I hope you'll allow me the chance to really try and do that, to step outside of AI and even science, engineering, history, and so on, and on occasion, talk to athletes, musicians, writers, and maybe even comedians who inspire me, especially up and coming comedians and musicians like Eric Weinstein, who yes, we'll do a third conversation with soon. I think if I allow myself to expand the range of these conversations on occasion, when I do return to science and engineering, I'll bring a new perspective and also a little bit more fun and a few extra listeners that may not otherwise realize how fascinating artificial intelligence, robotics, mathematics, and engineering truly is. All that said, please skip the episodes that don't interest you. You don't have to listen to all of them. Trust me, as someone who is a bit or a lot OCD, that idea is quite unpleasant. But life, friends, is full of unpleasant things. But as Hunter S. Thompson suggested, and I suggest as well, you should still buy the ticket and take the ride. If you enjoy this thing, subscribe on YouTube, review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, support on Patreon, or connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. As usual, I'll do a few minutes of ads now and no ads in the middle. I try to make these interesting, but I give you the timestamp, so please skip if you don't want to listen to the ads, but it does mean a lot to me when you do. And still please do check out the sponsors by clicking the links in the description, it really is the best way to support this podcast. This show is sponsored by PowerDot. Get it at powerdot.com slash Lex and use code Lex at checkout to get 20% off. I use it for muscle recovery for legs and shoulders, but you can also use it to build muscle, endurance, or even just warm up. In fact, I first heard about this kind of electrical muscle stimulation device in reading that Bruce Lee used it. He was an inspiration to me as someone who practices first principles thinking, especially in a discipline where conventional thinking is everywhere. He created a martial art called Jeet Kune Do that is in many ways, at least philosophically in his hybrid approach, a precursor to modern day mixed martial arts. There's a special kind of deep philosophical thinking that combat athletes or jiu-jitsu practitioners do that is unlike any other. I think it's grounded in the humbling process of getting your ass kicked a lot that removes any illusion of intellectual superiority. I think the journey towards wisdom starts when you humbly admit to yourself that you know very little or almost nothing. Anyway, go to powerdot.com slash Lex and use code Lex at checkout to get 20% off on top of the 30 day free trial. This show is also sponsored by Babbel, an app and website that gets you speaking in a new language within weeks. Go to babbel.com and use code Lex to get three months free. They offer 14 languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, German, and yes, Russian. Let me read a few lines from a Russian song by Vladimir Vysotsky called Anabolov Parija that you'll start to understand if you sign up to Babel. Наверное, я погиб, глаза закрою и вижу. Наверное, я погиб, рабею, а потом. Куда мне до нее, Анабалав Парижа? И я вчера узнал, не только в нем одном. The song always made me smile because it resonates with my own life. It translates loosely to, she's been to Paris. Paris for a Russian, I suppose, symbolizing a fancy life. And that the guy can never quite fit into that kind of life, 
expensive things, nice restaurants, cars, all of that. I was thinking about what song is equivalent in English. Maybe Uptown Girl by Billy Joel is similar in spirit, but very different in style. I just watched a video on YouTube for Uptown Girl, and it's basically Billy Joel dressed up as a, a mechanic, but dancing in a way that I'm pretty sure no mechanic has ever danced, turning the old cringe factor up to 11. Anyway, I always felt like I didn't really fit in with the fancy people, and that's what this song represents. But back to uh, Babbel. <laughs> get started by visiting babbel.com and use code LEX to get three months free. This show is presented by the great, the powerful, the OG sponsor, named unofficially after one of my favorite musicians, the man in black, Johnny Cash. That's Cash App, the number one finance app in the App Store. When you get it, use code Lex Podcast. The Cash App folks are truly amazing people and are teeming with ideas for cool contests, giveaways, and all that kind of stuff. I've been thinking of doing some kind of little contest and giving away 42 bucks to a bunch of people who win. It's not so much about the money, but the glory and the delicious taste of victory. If you have ideas for a contest, let me know. I was thinking of something like asking people to submit funny, inspiring photos or videos or audio of using Cash App or any of the sponsors of this podcast, really, or maybe even just funny things related to the podcast, like different weird places you might be watching or listening to me right now. I'm pretty sure there's somebody out there right now sitting in a hot tub with some wine watching me say this. I salute you, sir or madam. I may be opening up some floodgates I deeply regret later, so please make sure you're wearing clothes and whatever you sent me. There will be no naked people in the hot tub as part of this podcast. I have integrity and standards. <laughs> Let me know in the comments what ideas for contests you might have. Again, if you get Cash App from the App Store or Google Play and use the code LEXPODCAST, you get $10, and Cash App will also donate $10 to FIRST, an organization that is helping to advance robotics and STEM education for young people around the world. And now, here's my conversation with Ryan Hall. Who in your view is the greatest warrior in history, ancient or modern? That's a tough question, and, and again, I'm, I'm no historian by any measure, so I'll probably do the worst. Like, what are your best bands ever? I'm like, Metallica, and you know, so I'll, I'll pick the- Metallica the, just came out with a new album, by the way, with, with oh, the entire orchestra. That's that's kind of cool. Yeah. I support that. Metallica will, will yeah. always be one of the greatest. Yeah, that's so I agree with a you. bad example. They, if they were a well-known yet awesome band. Let me say it's like uh, Nickelback or something like that. And I mean, that, but I feel that feels cheap because everyone makes fun of Nickelback. Yeah. I don't know. I, I guess it depends on how you want to define Warrior. Something that I think about when it comes to trying to evaluate various people or situations or things that I've read about or heard about are uh, the circumstances that they were involved in because I, I think a lot of times it's easy to look at the outcomes and obviously outcome, we live in an outcome driven world and, and you know, outcomes do matter. But at the same time, like, uh, you know, you look at, let's say what Cuba has been able to pull off, you know, from a combat sports perspective, it's, it's staggering, you know, like the amount of successful Olympic level competitors they have in wrestling, boxing, judo. Uh, I mean, they're a tiny little island with no money and no people. It's, that's shocking, you know. When you com you think about the Olympics in the United States doing well, of course we should do well. I mean, Russia should do well, China should do well, uh, India should do better than they do. Honestly, like, obviously it means like they're not into it as much, or at least certain sports because they have the resources, people wise. Um, so talent's not going to be an issue. So there's something to like where the starting point is. Like that's the argument with like uh, why people say Maradona. If, I don't know if you're into. Uh, oh yeah, big soccer. Time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they say Maradona is, is is better than Messi because he basically carried the team and and won the World Cup with a team that wouldn't otherwise win the World Cup, and then Messi was only successful in Barcelona because uh, he has like superstars. He's playing with other superstars, right? Yeah, it's, it's fair to say. I mean, like like you know, there's there's a lot of factors that go into let's say winning a winning a soccer game, and you know, obviously Barcelona, you know, particularly for various points in time, had a ridiculous all star squad of world class players. But um, and I, you know, let's say for instance, maybe they didn't have the creative players in in Argentina. They needed to get the ball up to Messi. You know, they didn't have like the Iniesta and you know the you know the again the backing there in the midfield, but. Um, because obviously Argentina's always had ridiculous attacking players, like even alongside Messi, but they're like the three killers up front. Mm -hmm. And then, 
a little less behind. So it's interesting you, you say that it depends how you define warrior, because you can probably take like some of the civil rights leaders, you, you can go into that yeah. direction, like leaders in general. But if we just look at like the greatest martial artist in history in that direction, do you have somebody in mind? I, I would say at least three three that pop into my head and um, would be uh, Hannibal, um, Alexander the Great, and then maybe Miyamoto Musashi. Um, you know, the two commanders and then one, you know, guy, but, uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting. And then again, you mentioned warriors being able to make a lot out of a little, uh, you know, Musashi's famous for winning duels, you know, that were oftentimes one, they were one-on-one, -on -one. you know, the Alexander and Hannibal were, you know, military commanders and one of them faced Rome. And that was an interesting thing. Oftentimes, you know, coming up with novel tactics, different strategies, sometimes under, resourced doing having to do novel and crazy things there's skin in the game that's an interesting thing too i think a lot of times you know it's uh if you're playing a video game i don't think you can be a warrior because there's there's no skin in the game you get hurt you lose and that's a bummer it stings a little bit maybe it makes you feel slightly disappointed but uh you know musashi loses he loses um hannibal loses he loses alexander loses he loses and they lose uh, i guess the, the people around them lose so that's almost like uh you could use even from a combat sports perspective a muhammad ali i mean you consider also their quality of opposition musashi was fighting high quality opposition obviously hannibal and alexander particularly hannibal were fighting unbelievable opposition muhammad ali fought phenomenal opposition but he had skin in the game both in the ring and out and that actually meshes with as you mentioned like a civil rights you know type of situation where you are under resourced you're pushing the stone uphill and that was a neat thing i think about muhammad ali was how much you know personal conviction the man had to have in order to pull off what he was able to pull off both in in and outside of the ring and that reminds me of of again some of the other great leaders or great fighters throughout history so what do you make of the kind of very difficult idea that some of these conquerors like Alexander the Great and somebody that uh, if you listen to hardcore history, <laughs> oh, Dan Carlin, uh, who uh, apparently Elon Musk is also a big uh, fan of is the Genghis Khan episode. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a large percent of the world is, uh, is a, can call Genghis Khan an ancestor. So the difficult truth is about some of these conquerors is that there's a lot of murder and uh, rape and pillage and stealing of resources and all that kind of stuff. And yet they're often remembered as quite honorable. I mean, in the case of Genghis Khan, there's a lot of people who argue, if you look at the historically the way it's described in full context, is he was ultimately like a li given the time he was a liberator he was uh he was a progressive <laughs> i should say mm -hmm. uh you know like in terms of the the violence and the atrocities he committed he at least in the stories has always provided the option of not to do that it's only if you resist mm -hmm. do so you basically have the option do you want to join us or do you want to die and die horribly and so that, that's the progressive sort right. of, uh, that's the Bernie Sanders of the era. Nice. <laughs> so uh, what do you make of that? That there's so much of these great conquerors, there's so much murder that to us now would just seem insane. It's funny you mentioned it. I, th I think that maybe it's a human nature thing that we want to, uh, or, or, you know, maybe, or maybe a misunderstanding thing that we want to cast all of our characters and ourselves maybe as entirely good or as entirely negative when, you know, I guess I was, the phrase or the saying, you know, one man's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist um, is accurate. And a lot of times I think you can understand as long as you're able to look from various people's perspective. Like if you look at uh, the TV show, The Wire, um, which was obviously, you know, widely, everybody loves The Wire. Um, I thought that there were everyone, I mean, it's, I'm not saying anything that's, that's not been said before, but compelling characters from all angles, whether you like the character, dislike the character, you were able to understand the motivations of people doing various things. Even if they did wrongly, they did rightly. You know, we want to cast all of the, the, the demons throughout history as, as completely inhuman when I think that makes it difficult for us to understand them. And we want to look back at, at the people that we think of as great, um, and entirely great. And I think that we're, you know, we're experiencing the problems with this, you know, even right now, socially and politically, is we're trying to look back and decide that people we thought were good are not good, or people we thought were bad are now good, rather than going, hey, there's 
there's good and bad to all things. And there are, as you mentioned, the Genghis Khan thing, you don't have to fight back. You do, I respect you for it, but then we're gonna have a conflict and then we'll see what happens. And if you lose, you're gonna be sorry that you did because I have to make it that way if I wanna continue utilizing this this kind of MO because I need to discourage the next guy from doing what you're doing right now. And ultimately though, I guess that's an interesting thing. Imagine you put every single person on planet earth in a cage, crime drops, you know? Uh, <laughs> also, there are certain positives to that. And I, it's just things, are as they are, it's difficult, but that is ultimately more the law of the jungle. And I think that we're able to supersede some of that now in modern times, and I think we're fortunate. But as you mentioned, we look back and say, oh, this is horrible. Say, no, that that just is what it is. That's how life is at a base level. And you know, again, if you're a lion and I'm a gazelle, I don't, I don't really like it very much, but we don't call the lion the bad guy. We don't sanctify the gazelle or the other way around. So it, it's just, it's interesting when you pull back some of the controls that we put on our behavior and, you know, in modern life, which I think are generally speaking positive, you know, we get down to how things often are. And at the same time, we, we could, modern life was built by people like Genghis Khan. So then you get down to the ends justifying the means. It's a tough question. These aren't things with easy answers, or at least if they are, I certainly don't have the the smarts to figure out the answers to them. But uh, it's it's difficult. I would just say people in the world are, are complicated and layered, and depending upon which side of the line you're standing on at various times, you know, um, you may like or dislike someone. But I, I can't remember. Uh, it's I can't remember whose whose idea it was. This is killing me. But it's the veil of ignorance, I guess. Um, the philosophical, you know, um, you know, idea of the veil of ignorance. Where I go is is sticking everyone in the cage the right thing to do? And I say, or everyone but me, and I say, well, no, why? Well, it would make my life easier if I just went over and took all of your stuff as long as you couldn't stop me. I mean, of course, that's a great idea. That's what everyone does in every video game. <laughs> but uh, in Skyrim, you steal stuff when people aren't around. But um, ultimately, you go, well, this isn't the right thing to do because if I were on the other side of it, I would I would not appreciate it. It's, it's inherently not a good thing to do. I'm only doing it because I think I'm gonna win. And that's a fine way to be, but you don't have the white hat on, I guess I would say. So I, I think without those philosophical underpinnings to rein us in, you know, I guess morally speaking, it, it's very difficult to say what's right or wrong. And you'd say certain actions have a reaction, almost like a physics sense. If you kill everyone in your way for as long as you're able to, your life will be easier. I mean, you're setting the table for someone doing the same to you when you're no longer the tough guy, but it is what it is. Yeah, if you look at like the Instagram channel, Nature is Metal, it hurts my heart to watch, to remind me, a comfortable descendant of ape, how vicious nature is. Just unapologetically, uh, just, I mean, there's a, there's a process to it where the bad guy always wins, <laughs> the, the violence, is the solution to most problems or, or the flip side of that running away from violence is the solution depending on your skill set and it's funny to think of us humans with our extra little piece of brain that we're somehow trying to figure out like you said in a philosophical way how to supersede that how to like move past the viciousness the cruelty the just the cold exchange of nature but perhaps it's not so, maybe that is nature, maybe that's the way of life. Maybe we're trying too hard to, uh, we're, we're being too egotistical and thinking we're somehow separate from nature. We're somehow distant from that very thing. I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, I think actually Orson Scott Card, you know, who's the writer of a, a great book called Ender's Game, um, was, this was a, a statement that, that the main character, you know, Ender uh, made in the book. His brother was brilliant. Um, his brother was like kind of sociopathic, brilliant kid that was ended up kicked out of the school that they were all into for battle commander. Dealing with his brother taught him that ultimately strength, courage, the ability to do violence uh, for all the good and the bad of that is one of the fundamental, most important things to be able to do in life. Because if you can't cause destruction, if you can't cause pain, you will be forever subject to those who can. And I think that you mentioned egotism. I think that, that that's a disease that could obviously strike any of us, but it's something that we're looking at now. We're, you know, I think we should be unbelievably thankful as people that live in the world that, that we do, um, that we can walk down the street without having to worry that I'm like, well, don't worry that that six foot six, 270 pound person over there is just gonna leave me alone. 
and I have a Rolex on, but whatever, and I'll be fine because that person is deciding to leave me alone because we've all agreed to live in this relatively, you know, sane and or, you know, constrained society because it benefits all of us. And we're doing it because of a philosophical underpinning, not because nature dictates it be that way, because nature dictates it go in a very, very different direction. And the only person, the only thing stopping that person from doing something to me is either me, that person, or someone else that will stand in between us. And if I can't do it, and there's no one there to stand in between us, then the only thing stopping that person is that person. And I have to hope that they're uh, either disinterested or disinclined to do that sort of thing. And I, I think that, uh, you know, it's keeping in mind that, that that is the fundamental nature of the world, whether we like it or not, um, is important. And I think the the quest to, to fundamentally alter human nature is going to be ultimately fruitless. And then also it's, it is a little bit egotistical. A lion does what a lion does. You know, we we can try to box it in and we can try to, you know, guide this direction, that direction. But, you know, the nature is as it is and as it always will be unless we want to start to constrain it significantly. But now I'm starting to get into individual rights. Who put me in charge? Who says that I should be the one to make the choice is constraining because many of the most awful things that have happened throughout history, one group or one person has decided to constrain others. And we don't like Genghis Khan doing that. Well, I'll do that on a little level. Are there going to be benefic benefits and beneficiaries? Absolutely. But there'll be losers in that too. So I guess it's a, it's a dangerous game. It's almost like putting on the one ring. You know, we remember when Frodo offered the one ring to Gandalf and Gandalf said, no, no, I would take it away. I, I would put it on. I would use it out of the desire to do good. But through me, it would wield a power so terrible you can't imagine. I think that's that's the big question for anyone that decides that's able to have reach and able to have power. I mean, it was obviously I can't speak to that, but imagine you did have national level, global level power. How would you use it? Would you try to change the world? Would you be glad that you did down the line? I don't know. Yeah, there's uh, I mean, that's the thing we're struggling now as a society. Maybe it'd be nice to get your quick comment on that, which is um, the people who have traditionally been powerless are now, you know, seeking a fair society, a more, equal society and in in attaining more power justly uh, there's also a realization at least from my perspective that power corrupts everyone even if you're even if the flag you wave is that of of justice right and so you know not to overuse the term, but it'd be nice if you have thoughts about the whole idea of cancel culture and the internet <laughs> and, and and Twitter and so on, where there's uh, nuanced, difficult discussions of uh, of race, of gender, of fairness, equality, justice, all of these kinds of things. There's a shouting down oftentimes of nuanced discussion of kind of, trying to reason through these very difficult issues, through our history, through what our future looks like. Do you have thoughts about the internet discourse that's going on now? Is there something positive <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> that I, we can pull out of this? It's, it's an interesting thing to see, I guess. As you mentioned, anytime you're wielding power, whomever you are, doing so carefully is, is important. And it's very, very easy to look at the people that have power and that are using it poorly or have used it poorly and go, hey, you're the bad guy. And then go, well, of course, if I had power, I'll, I'll use it properly. And I may intend to use it properly, and maybe I will. But at the same time, we see a lot of times people are people are people. I think that um, a lot of the, I think if you if you believe that that human beings are all one, which I do, you know, no matter whether you're here, you're there, you're, you're you got two arms, two legs, a heart, a brain. It, we all live a, a similar experience, you know, and obviously we have variations on a theme, but, uh, you know, you're no less a human being if, if I, you're a person I've never met from China than, than some person in, in Virginia. It's, we're all, we're all people. And I guess ultimately, if I believe that human beings are corruptible and that power corrupts and that we're all fallible and we say and do things that either intentionally or unintentionally, um, that we wish we'd not, um, I think that the I have to allow for a, a space of, I guess the word, to, it's almost a religious term, but I guess I would just say grace. And that's something that I see disappearing from 
discourse in the public, or maybe it wasn't there, I'm not sure, but it's interesting, you know, watching this occur on the internet because also now no longer are you and I just having a, a talk sitting on a on a bus stop. It's now in writing. Everything's in writing. The old the old saying, like, don't put that in writing. You're like, yeah. don't put anything in writing. That's how you get in trouble. And basically, uh, you know, with with the degree to which everything is recorded, but recorded in tiny little bites, it's very, very easy for me to wave every less little foolish, ignorant, incorrect, or correct thing that someone has ever said or done in their face to support whatever argument that I'm trying to make about them or a, or a situation. And I think that you mentioned cancel culture, or you know, as it seems to exist. Obviously, this is poisonous on its face. This is poisonous. Um, it's it's the sort of thing that doesn't incentivize proper behavior. I mean, you look at let's say one of the great monsters of history, Adolf Hitler. Obviously, who's done awful, awful things, but also for anyone that's a, even a minor student of history, did some positive things as well. We don't have to. I don't have to embroider this person's crimes. I don't have to act as if there was nothing good a monster has ever done and nothing bad that that a great person throughout history has ever done. But imagine the ghost of Adolf Hitler were to pop up and go, oh my gosh, guys, I'm so sorry. I, I know what I've done, uh, but I'd like to apologize and start to make it right. Well, I mean, you'd hope that you, you know, if he popped up over here, you go, like, well, I don't really like what you've done. <laughs> And I don't like you, but at the same time, I'm glad to hear that you're attempting to make this right and push in a positive direction, even if you can't make it right. Because otherwise, what am I doing? I'm disincentivizing change for the better. I'm, I'm looking to wield whatever power I have in a punitive fashion, um, which does not encourage people to do anything other than double down on, on the wrongs that they've made, knowing that at least they're going to have some support from the people that support that. And I, I guess I want to... You, you would hopefully look at the use of the internet as a, as a tool that can educate, and I guess I don't like the word empower, but empower people to do various things, extend their reach, but, uh, but educate and learn rather than to further solidify little tribal things that, that exist, which I think everyone in humanity and human history is, is vulnerable to. I mean, look at the course of human history. It's deeply tribal. And the tribes or the groups that have been on top at various points in time have done a lot of times bad things to the ones that have not. And you'd hope that we could learn lessons from the past and rather than, you know, committing the crimes that were, you know, that were committed against us, recommitting them when we slide into the top position, um, say, you know, I could do this now, but I'll not. You know, I understand the urge to to seek vengeance is strong. Uh, anyone that says differently, I don't, I wouldn't trust. <laughs> you know, but at the same time, we go, I've, we, we have enough experience in history, enough experience in life, enough, hopefully, wisdom, you know, time in to go. This isn't the right answer. This is only going to replay the things, the the worst parts of our history, not the best. And I want to encourage positive behavior. And if I just again further lash out at people, although understandably uh, done done understandably, I'm, I'm simply just going to just perpetuate the cycle that's gone on to this point. So you hope that even though we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of turmoil societally at the moment and globally at the moment, that. Uh, I guess our better angels can prevail at a certain point, but it's going to take a great deal of leadership. And I think that we're we're sorely missing like a Martin Luther King style character at the moment or a great leader. And I just, I'm hoping that one will show up. For sure. And by the way, a word I don't hear often, and I think it's a beautiful one, which is grace. That's a really interesting word. I'm going to have to think about that. It is it, There is a religious component to it, but it's exactly right. It um, You have to somehow walk the line between, you know, you mentioned Hitler. I've been reading uh, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. I'm really thinking about the 1930s and what, what it's like to have uh, economic, my concern is the economic pain that people are feeling now quietly is really a suffering that's not being heard. And there's echoes of that in the in the 20s and the 30s with the Great Depression. And there's a hunger for a charismatic leader. Like you said, there's a leader that could walk with grace, could inspire, could uh, could bring people together with, uh, with sort of uh, dreams of a better future that's positive. But uh, Hitler did exactly everything that I just said, except for the word positive which is he did give a dream to the German people who were a great people, who are great people of, um, of a better future. It's just that a certain point that quickly turned into the better future requires literally 
expansion of more land. It started with, well, if we want to build a great Germany, we need a little bit more land. And so we need to kind of get Austria, then we need to kind of get France, mostly because France doesn't understand that more land is really useful, so we need to get rid of them. And look what they did to us in Versailles anyway. But so the Jew, the Jewish, uh, the Holocaust is a separate thing. I don't know. Well, I don't know. I don't know what to think of it because uh, so me being Jewish and having a lot of so the echoes of the suffering is in my family of the people that are lost. I don't know because Hitler wrote all about it in Mein Kampf. So I don't know if the evil he committed was all, there all along. I mean, and that that's where the question of forgiveness, I mean, Hitler is such a difficult person to talk about, but it's the question of um, cancel culture, who is deserving of forgiveness and who is not. Like the Holocaust survivors that I've read about, that I've heard the interviews with, they've often spoken about the fact that the way for them to let go to overcome the atrocities that they've experienced is to forgive. Like forgiveness is the way out for them. It's interesting to think about. I, I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know if we're even as a society ready to even contemplate an idea of forgiveness for Hitler. It's it's an interesting idea though. It was it's a good thought exercise at the very least to think about like all these people that are being canceled uh, for doing bad things of different degrees. Think of like Louis CK or somebody like that for being not a good person, but like, what is the path for forgiveness? And also what's a good person? What is a good person? That's a, if that's a sliding scale that we could all find ourselves looking at the uncomfortable end of a gun on, you know, particularly down the line, I mean, you hope for the best, but these definitions, I guess, like you said, are important. And who's doing the canceling? Who's being canceled? I'm not necessarily, as you said, saying that that's entirely unjustified or certainly not. It's certainly understandable. And particularly, you mentioned like a, a monster like an Adolf Hitler. But it's also interesting. I, I couldn't help but notice, like you mentioned, as, as a society, us being able to apply forgiveness to someone who's done so much horror. But people who are personal, I mean, of course, many, so many people have been personally affected, but directly personally affected, someone, a survivor of the Holocaust being able to let go on that. I'm, I'm nowhere near big enough a person for that sort of thing. But I guess that's that's an interesting thing. You know, being the person who was physically there, potentially able to able to let go. I don't know, that's that's unbelievably powerful. It's it's interesting. I guess you have to wonder sometimes, and this isn't obviously in regards to, to that to the Holocaust, but why why I'm holding on to various things. Have I what is it doing for me and what is it doing to me? Is it facilitative? Is it not? And I guess that's something else that I I really enjoy. When I was on Ultimate Fighter, they uh they don't let you have um, any music or any books other than religious text. So I brought a Bible and I brought a Quran and I started to read them side by side. And and it was it was really interesting reading. The Bible's a little drier. Quran's the Quran's more interesting. At least written. But um, I I think something that that was consistently brought up uh was the way most merciful people want. I don't think any of us want justice. We think we want justice, but I don't think we want justice. Justice is a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous game because maybe this person's wronged me deeply and I, I want justice. I want to balance it out because what is justice if not a balancing of the scales? And sometimes you can understand it and on a societal level, I think it's fine. I mean, there's crime and punishment and we can go for the benefits and the drawbacks of that. But I think what any of us want is mercy within reason, you know, grace, as you mentioned, because justice is a very, very, very dangerous thing and it's a valuable and important thing. but who gets to decide what's just, what justice is actually meted out. Maybe I get to mete out justice, but it's not, I don't get my comeuppance. Well, that sounds great. But what happens when it's pointed back at me? And uh, I, I guess that comes back to the veil of ignorance. You know, the idea that that one day I will have to live in the world in which I've envisioned and wor the world in which I've created. I, I think that a lot of times people love the idea of uh, they're a judge for your crimes and a lawyer for theirs. And uh, I heard that the other day. I thought that was great. And uh, I, I think that's a, that's a dangerous thing. And hopefully it gives us all pause before rightly or wrongly, but always understandably, you know, wielding, wielding 
serious power. Yeah, justice is a kind of drug. So if you look at history, also been reading a lot about Stalin. I mean, all those folks really, I don't know, I don't know what was inside Hitler's head actually, that he's a tricky one because I think he was legitimately insane. Stalin was not. And Stalin was like, he literally thought he's doing a good thing. He literally thought for the entirety of the time that communism is going to bring, like that's the utopia, and is going to create a happy world. And in his, there, in his mind were ideas of justice, of fairness, of happiness, of, of um, yeah, human flourishing. And that's, that's a drug and it somehow sadly pollutes the mind. When you start thinking like that, what's good for society and believing that you have a good sense of what's good for society, that's intoxicating, especially when others around you are feeling the same way. And then you start like building up this movement and you forget that you are just like a, you're, you're like barely recently evolved from an ape. Like you don't know what the hell you're doing. And then you start like killing witches or whatever. Like you start, you start I mean, doing. They did math. Let's be honest, though. I mean, sometimes you got a witch has to go. A witch, yeah, we can all agree that a witch, a witch has to go. If if it floats or sinks, which one? I forget which, which one. Which whichever one we need at the time. Honestly, <laughs> yeah, it's it's floating. It should have sunk. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, we we can definitely agree that witches have to go. Because you brought it up, I uh, tweeted recently, but also just. I'm, one of the things I'm really ashamed of in my life is I haven't really read almost any of the sci-fi classics. Really? Yeah, so like I, my whole journey through reading was through like uh, the f literary philosophers, I would say, like Camus, Hesse, Dostoevsky, Kafka, like that place. Like that's a kind of sci-fi world in itself, but it's it, it just... <sighs> It creates a world in which the the deepest questions about human nature can be explored. I didn't realize this, but the sci-fi world is the same. It just puts it in a, it like removes it from any kind of historical context to where you can explore those same ideas in like space somewhere elsewhere in a different time, a different place. It allows you almost like more freedom to like construct these artificial things where you can just do crazy, a uh, crazy kind of human experiment. So I'm now working through it. Uh, the books on my list are the Foundation series by Isaac Asimov, Dune, uh, Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson and Ender's Game, like you mentioned. Uh, that's just kind of, and then, so I posted that. And then of course, like Elon Musk, John uh, Carmack, I don't know if you know him, creator of Doom and Quake. And oh, cool. Stuff. See, they all pitched in. These nerds, these ultra nerds, just started like going like these. Uh, you need to read this, that, and and the other. So I've like started working out. Okay, but it seems like the list I've mentioned holds up somewhat. Is there a book? Is there sci-fi books or series or authors that that you find are just amazing? Maybe another way to ask that is like. What's the greatest sci-fi book of all time? Well, I, I'd like to start by uh, sharing something that I, I'm embarrassed about, yeah. is that I haven't read anything other than, uh, you know, Orson Scott Card, yeah. J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, Frank Herbert, Tolkien. Yeah. Yep. Dune. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm aware through Wikipedia and uh, through through surface reading of things that like a book called The Republic was written once. Um, yeah, there were some good. other some other good ones. So you read Wikipedia. You're uh, a prolific reader of Wikipedia articles. Well, or occasional, okay, yeah, <laughs> occasional, occasional reader. Yeah, exactly. In, in between uh, whatever else it is that I waste my time on, but <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so I also I should say I posted on Reddit questions for uh, Ryan Hall, and there's like a million questions, but like uh, half of them have to do with Dune. No, not really. But like <laughs> people bring up Dune. I don't understand why. I is, did you mention Dune before? Um, well, I actually, we actually have a show roll actually made us a, a gi, a Dune themed gi one time, which I thought was kind of cool. Oh. I, I'll send you one. I'll give you one. We got extra. Awesome. <laughs> but uh, actually, to, to your to your point, actually, uh, this is a Orson Scott Card quote. Actually, the writer of Ender's Game, um, fiction because it's not about somebody who actually lived in the real world. Always has the possibility about of being about oneself. 
And I, I think that's a neat thing because I, I have heard, you know, other very, people whom I respect and very sharp people actually every now and then dig their heels and go, I don't like fiction. I only like nonfiction. It's more, it's more instructive. And I would go, well, I completely disagree with that. I think we have a hard enough time figuring out what happened at 7-Eleven three hours ago that let me tell you what happened 600 years BC. I'm like, hey, I'm interested, but don't tell me this isn't a story too. Yeah. There's, a, there's, there's, actu there's factual components, I have no doubt, but we struggle sometimes to, like, I guess what I like about fiction is that you can tell me a story. It's all about people. I mean, every now there's more and less believable things. Um, and I think Dune would be an unbelievably well-written, in my opinion, for whatever, I, you know, what do I know? But I really like Dune, I'll say that. Um, well-written example of, you know, human beings interacting with one another, the political component to that, the emotional, the intellectual, um, the relationship components to all of that. And uh, I, I think that Dune is neat because it's a sci-fi novel, but only in the only in the loosest sense. It's It's really a story about religion, about group dynamics, about human potential, about um, belief, learning, politics, governance, ecology. It's uh, the, the best stories remind me of history. The same way history, hopefully, is not just a, a list of facts that I try to be able to recall or, or factoids that I try to recall, but a story that I can understand and and see how how the threads of time kind of came together and created certain things. And a lot of times, like we say, I'm like, oh, how the heck is what's going on right now or 100 years from now or 100 years in the past happened? And you can look back far enough if we had accurate knowledge, if we had that like that hypothetical perfect pool shot, you know, at the beginning of time, we would see an unbroken chain of events that led us to where we are and, and where we are will potentially lead us to where we're going, which is again, why hindsight's helpful. But I think it's neat. Like, I guess I really enjoy, for instance, a book like Dune and they're actually making a movie out of it, which I'm, I'm skeptical of, to be honest, because it's it's going to be difficult to to bring that to the screen for a variety of reasons. But yeah, one of there's them, at least a hundred questions. Ask Ryan what he thinks about the new Dune movie. I am not enough of an authority <laughs> to have any sort of decent opinion. But I guess what I would say is so much of it goes on in the character's mind. Like how much of any of our day is, is any lived experience, as it were, is internal. Like, the majority. How many times are people walking around? And you know they can you could, they're like hey what do you see right now I'm like oh uh, well I see this picture I see a wall hey there's Lex but really what was what I was paying attention to it was what was going on inside of my head for a moment and almost the rest of the world tuned out and kind of dimmed and uh, yeah I guess um, that I think that's going to be a struggle to to any time you want to bring that type of a, a written story to to a, a visual medium I think it's going to be more difficult but it'll it'll be interesting it's definitely I, my one of my favorite stories and it's been. It's, it's honestly helped me become better at life, in my opinion, better at the martial arts. And I think the the writer, I think Frank Herbert was absolutely brilliant, whether those were all his ideas, which in uh, reality, none of us are, all of our good ideas aren't ours. We're a combination. Maybe you came up with something, you're a curator of other good ideas and some things you borrowed from somewhere without even realizing it. But uh, I, I think the the way the messages and the themes and the ideas that were conveyed, particularly in the original novel, are just absolutely brilliant. Is that uh, is that to you one, one of the greats? And uh, and the flip side of that, like, or another way to ask that is like, if somebody's new to sci-fi, is that something you would recommend? That that is an entry point. I'm not well read enough in the sci-fi world. Like, I haven't read a lot of like Isaac Asimov or anything like that. But I, I just I'll recommend Dune. I'll be an obnoxious like evangelist for Dune to anyone who will listen. <laughs> Great. So I, I yeah, I would strongly <laughs> recommend it. So the other thing you mentioned. Now I should probably be talking to you about much more important things. But the other thing you mentioned <laughs> is Skyrim. Uh, do you play video games? What's your favorite game? What's what? What would you say is the greatest video game of all time? Because I'm a huge fan of Elder Scrolls. Oh, cool. Skyrim. Yeah, I I mean I play a little bit. Um, at this point, you know, a little little less. Um, uh, finally moved into a new house, so I'm. Gonna... So you're like an adult. No, oh no, no, I'm like a better funded twelve year old. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's entirely that's, that's, that's entirely <laughs> accurate. Better funded twelve year old, but um somewhat better funded 12 year old not as well funded as i wish but, but historically uh, did you play video games oh yeah, yeah i played as a kid i was you know again i've always liked playing sports and and liked reading and uh, i always enjoy video games but my favorite video game i think i've ever played was uh knights of the old republic um it was a star wars game I'm a huge star wars fan until oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it become less so so recently disney 
Um, um, you don't like the? I haven't watched it yet. Oh, Ma- Ma- Mandalorian. Oh, don't go oh, there. I, oh, actually, I like Mandalorian. That was that was actually pretty <laughs> cool. Like yeah, the, waving this off. Yeah, canceled. No, I just, <laughs> yeah, I will. If I could cancel one thing, I would cancel Disney Star. I'm gonna Wars. edit that part out. Okay, let's go to the next. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> this is where if people are wondering if you're watching this on YouTube and like the dislike amount is like eighty percent, that's just because of that comment. So, good job, good job <laughs> for making the internet hate I regret you. Nothing. Uh, what about uh, B- uh, Baby Yoda? Yeah, I guess it, it, yeah, he's like he's little, he's got ears, and he uses the force sometimes, and he passes out. I guess no, no qualms with Baby Yoda. Yeah, you don't have a heart. Okay, <laughs> I, the <laughs> let's go to jujitsu if it's okay. <laughs> uh, so the audience of this podcast may not know much about jujitsu, or they do because it's really part of the culture now, but they don't yeah. really know much. They see that so many people have fallen in love with it, have been transformed through it, but they don't know much about like, what is this thing? Is there a way you could sort of try to explain the what is jujitsu, what is the essence of this martial art that's captured the minds and hearts of so many people in the world? I think that jujitsu is is a philosophy that's expressed physically and that it's the kind of development of the mental capacity and physical capacity working in in unison to uh, move efficiently and almost flowingly unresistingly um, with with a given situation with a with their physically resisting opponent um, learning how to generate force on your own and how to steal force from the floor how to steal force from the other person and move in concert with it as opposed to clash against which if you watch two untrained people fight it's almost entirely a clash it's a runaway and clash a runaway and clash um, if you watch jujitsu done well it's it it looks like water moving around a solid structure and and i think that that is expressed physically and i think that all of the things that anyone has really been able to do very very well in in jujitsu end up kind of exemplifying that but i think that's true of martial arts in general i think that a lot of times like the clashing that we see going on um and working well is just the fact that, you know, you get very, very physically powerful people every now and then they're able to get away with this. But I don't think that that's, and that's, that's fantastic because ultimately it's a results driven thing. But I think that the essence of the martial arts is learning how to make more out of less and how to move with and be yielding, you know, almost like real life Aikido. And uh, so you think of martial arts, uh, Jiu Jitsu as uh, like water or fire flowing so aikido so moving around the the force as opposed to sort of maybe the wrestling mindset is finding a leverage where you can apply an exceptional amount of force so like so like maximizing the application of force i guess maybe that's a better way to i'd like to marry the two ideas you know because i think you flow until the point at which you are the greater force at which point in time you can apply but uh if we look at the best wrestlers and then when i say best i don't necessarily mean most successful although of course most successful are, are always very very good um throughout the course of history in boxing in wrestling in judo um they, they're magical they they disappear and reappear it's like fighting a ghost that that is like incorporeal when you want to find it but then when you don't want it to find it when you don't want to find it it finds you and uh i, I think that we see that in the like the buvice societies of wrestling um and you know i guess you you could look at a uh, floyd mayweather or willie pep or uh you know pernell whitaker in boxing um as, as brilliant examples of disappearing and reappearing and when you're strong it's almost like guerrilla warfare when you're strong i'm nowhere to be found when you're weak you can't get rid of me and i, I think that's what we're looking for yeah the tf brothers are incredible at that they just they, they look like uh skinny starbucks baristas and uh they just manhandle everybody like effort effortlessly they look like they just kind of woke up yeah. rolled out of bed uh, fighting for like the, the the gold medal at the olympics and just effortlessly throw uh like uh, there's a match against you i guess yo romero yeah so like you you know if, if you look at like who is the guy who's like intimidating in this case uh and terrifying looking it's uh it's, it's yo romero just like a physical specimen and obviously like a super accomplished wrestler. I think this is for the gold medal, yeah. In 2000. Yeah, 2000. Yeah, yeah, Sydney. And then there. Yeah, this is the year you all took silver. 
and what you like <sighs> just to sh just show you like there's a inside trip effortless uchi and he, he does it again yep you know it's a really creative kind of wrestling where it's organic you, yeah you throw in all these kinds of things this is a mix of judo a mix of like weird kind of moves it's not like as funky as uh ben Askren. it's it's just like legitimate basic well it's not funky for funky's sake and i'm not, I'm not poking right. ben Askren to imply that, that that's what he's doing but it's like it, it's funny it's like a lot of times it's almost like a musashi talked a lot about that you know that the only goal of combat is to win is the the outcome is it's outcome driven versus like flourishing you know cool looking movements it's like unless that had a, a utilitarian purpose like what are you what are you wasting your time with that yeah. both in the fight and also you know in, in practice but but as you mentioned it's almost like it looks like judo it looks like wrestling it looks like jujitsu it's almost like i guess the reminds me all of the martial arts is again deeply tribal as well i i want to learn lex fridman martial arts and then i want to learn another you know i guess transcendent person's martial arts and it just happened to be the set of movements that you tended to do most of the time thanks to your body type and your opposition and whatnot but then i try to codify that and force those to work as opposed to going i want to understand how the body works in concert and in in Congress with something else and other forces and move appropriately. And that's why it's like, it always struck me that the Scythe brothers are great examples of just moving like water, but they, to, to use Bruce Lee, which is a little trite, but again, he's brilliant. It's like water can flow or water can crash and they would crash when they needed to crash and they would flow when they needed to flow, but they would flow for the purpose of dissipating and then crash when they would win and at the right moment, then go back to flowing the second that the other person found them. And it's just, it's beautiful to watch. It's artistic. And I think that that great expression of anything physical is ultimately studied as a science, but expressed as an art. And I think that that's something that gets lost in jujitsu a lot of times when it gets a little bit, a little nerdy, like do this hand here, hand here. Like if like the more details I have, the better. When in reality, that's just not, in, not in my experience, how it's done. It might be a fun exercise of saying like, what are the main positions and submissions in the art of jujitsu? You don't have to be complete. That's a ridiculously, I apologize for putting you on the no, spot no, no. like this, but it might be a nice exercise to think through it. Sure. I mean, I would just say that there, are, there are, you have your arms bend in various ways. You have key lock, Americana, straight arm locks, Kimura, Omoplata. Omoplata is a Kimura, Kimura is an Omoplata. It's just That's executed. Submissions. So like it's submissions, yes. Breaking also, off your arm in right. all kinds of ways. But ultimately, it, the question is, let's say you were a Terminator, like a robot that I, which of course you are. Go uh, on. Then go on. <laughs> it's like, all right, so we're, we're being completely literal. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and I and I couldn't harm you with any of these things. Would I still use these positions? The answer is yes. They, they create leverage, they create control, they create shapes that I can affect and that can affect me and they can be affected through other forces and other objects or structures like the ground or the wall. I really enjoy mixed martial arts because there's another component rather than just me and you and the floor, there's me, you, the floor and the wall. And it's another player in the game that doesn't exist uh, in a grappling context with an, uh, in a non-enclosed, you know, I guess area of combat. But um, you can strangle me or choke me, um, what do you call it, uh, without my arms being involved, or you can use one of my shoulders to pin one side of my one carotid artery off and you can enclose the other. You can turn my knee in the exact same ways that you can turn my arm straight this way and that way. You can add a rotation to that or it can be directly linear against the joint. So I guess what I would say is the more that I've been able to understand jujitsu, the more that I've been, it's, it's given me an, a, a look into how we learn language where rather than learning five bazillion adjectives, I go, I understand what an adjective is. And of course we are all read into some degree of, of vocabulary. I understand what an adverb does. And I understand what an adverb is. I know what a noun is. I know what the component parts of a sentence are. I know what, a, you know, I guess a clause, a contraction, any of these things. And it allows you to be um, interesting and artistic with your language to the extent that you can. But I can't, like, I can speak a degree of Spanish, but I'm not even slightly artistic in Spanish. I would be something, I'd be, I speak like a, like a child with a head injury. And anyway, um, the, the but your basic understanding of the English language allows you to then be a student of Spanish. 100%, but I'm limited by my experience. I'm limited by my understanding of techniques. And I'm limited under by my understanding, almost like, let's say techniques are like these, are like vocabulary. 
Um, so even if I kind of sort of grasp the sentence structure and the thought process and the thought patterns of, of Spanish, which it's interesting because just even the, the orientation and the organization of a language, and I've thought about this a great deal, um, you know, the way that I perceive the world is affected deeply by the language that I learned. The, you know, the, again, if I learned, I have no idea how the Chinese language structures, but I can only imagine that it would be, that it would affect, it's like a different lens. We're all looking at the same thing, but I have, I have a different set of sunglasses on than you do. Um, and, uh, that's, that's very, very interesting. I'll use the Quran as an example. You know, apparently it's, it's unbelievably poetic and in Arabic still neat and, and was interesting reading in English, but I'm told by people that I trust that it, it just one doesn't bear a resemblance to the other. And I think that's a very interesting thing that you may be able to say the same thing, but in, in a more, in, I guess in a different way, in a more artistic way that, that may not translate on a one for one kind of fidelity. But, um, the more that we're able to understand about how the body works, the more examples of the body working this way, the body working that way, the body working that way, the more that I'm able to eventually become an artist. But it has to be studied as a science first. And it does start with technique collection, vocabulary collection, the same way we learn in school, where you remember how to say quickly 17 different ways. And let's say I speak Spanish, I'm only, I, I only know three. So you might use quickly, you might use an adjective like quickly in Spanish, but use one of the many, many options to describe that, that I don't understand. And now I sit there and go like, wait, what? I can't be artistic. I can't be as organic with the language as I'd like. So I believe that jujitsu a lot of times starts with the acquisition of a lot of, hey, do this, this, this drill, this technique. Here's an Americana, Americana to an arm lock, arm lock to a triangle. Um, but the problem with that is oftentimes we get stuck in that phase. Um, and I, people eventually become move collectors or sequence collectors. And I notice this when I'm trying to do DVD or I guess like an instructional series now, or even teaching in class, I, I don't believe in that form of learning anymore. Um, not that it's not valuable, but I, I don't believe, I don't understand jujitsu on that level anymore. So what I'm trying to do is get across the basic ideas to people and say, hey, you need to fill in the gaps with going to class all the time. You need to go, hey, learn this move, learn that technique, learn that technique, because otherwise I'm basically just throwing at you like 75 different words that you could use, but that hasn't really taught you how to how to speak a language. Whereas if you give me the language structure, you can fill in these pieces on your own and then eventually speak organically in lex form, which will be ultimately unique to you because otherwise you just end up being like a weird facsimile of whatever it is that I'm doing for mostly the worst, I'd say. But uh, yeah, that's what people, I mean, people comment like, is this, especially people who haven't listened to me before, uh, is this guy drunk or high? Does he, does, does MIT really allow slow people to, uh, <laughs> to be like, quotas. what's wrong? <laughs> like, <Quotas, yeah. laughs> like, what's, what's wrong with him? Is he getting sleep? Are you okay? Does he need help? So that, that's similar with my jujitsu. It's like, does, is this guy, is this guy really, whatever rank I was throughout, I, I remember just like, is this guy really this rank? I just have a very kind of certain way of sitting and being slow and lazy looking that there was ultimately the language that I had to discover. And it was, uh, it was yeah, it was a very liberating moment, I think, of probably a few years of getting my ass kicked, especially with Open Guard and Butterfly to where you really allow yourself to take in the entirety of the language and realize that, um, that I'm not, I'm different. I'm a unique, I, I'm, I'm unique. And like, I have a very, um, I have a language, I have a set of techniques, a way I move my body that needs, to, that I'm the one to discover. Like it's, you can only, you can learn specific techniques and so on, but you really have to understand your own body. And that's the beautiful thing about jujitsu, like you said, is like the, the connection about your philosophy, your view of the world with the physical and like connecting those two things, how you perceive the world, how you interpret ideas of the world about exhaustion, about force, about effortlessness, like what it really means to relax, all these kinds of loose concepts, and then actually teach your body to like do those things. And like, you know, and be able to apply force in spurts, be able to relax in spurts and like figure all that stuff out for my, for your, my individual body. But it's a, as you mentioned, that's I couldn't agree with you more. It's a discovery process and no one can cheat that process, which is at the same time, it's almost like imagine I wanna start writing books in second grade, unless maybe I'm like staggeringly brilliant, like, which I can only conceptualize someone being able to do that, but maybe a Mozart of the English language where you're out there doing it. But for most of us, we don't have enough knowledge, enough information, enough experience to be able to 
be to express ourselves. So we have to basically input, repeat, um, which is important, but it's the process, as you say, of going through that, of getting your ass kicked, of just like, well, that didn't work. Well, that didn't work. That felt right. But I don't know. Nobody else does that. I guess I don't believe in that versus eventually going, I don't know. I'll just try going my own way and see what happens. And now I'll get yelled at and people won't like me. And if it works, they'll say I got lucky. And if it doesn't work, they'll say I was dumb, but, uh, which maybe all is right. But basically, uh, you know, going through that iterative process that that allows you to eventually find your self-expression and find your voice so that you you fight the same way that you speak, the same way that you write, the same way that you think in a way that that is uniquely you, that will also ultimately allow you to understand other people being uniquely them. Because even if you can only conceptualize, and I think about this a lot for society stuff, where I go, well, this is how I feel about this, but oh, am I objectively right? Maybe about a couple of things, but that's a small box that I have to be very, very careful about what I think is objective and versus what's not. And I have to be open to the possibility that all the things that I think are objectively correct may or may not be. And that should allow me to have some degree of compassion or consideration for other people, both in their martial arts journey and in their in their journey, you know, as, as people, as human beings, because I understand that they're on a it, it's a we're all on a path where it's all a pr an, an, again an iterative process of, of eventual self-expression but i think that's one of the things that we see having trouble when we see tribalism which i mean racism expression of that political affiliation expression of that all of these things that can go in really uncomfortable directions people are looking for hey where do i plant my feet over here where's where's the, the thing that i know is right and we can all agree on the following and I, I think that we see that in martial arts. We're like, oh, I do this style. Well, I do that style. I do that style. It's like, hey, man, we're all just pushing forward in a certain direction here, trying to do our best. And I understand why you feel the way you do. I may have felt like that at one point too. But, uh, you know, we're, we're, I'm just trying to learn and understand versus I've already acquired enough knowledge. Let me cross my arms and start to to look who's fucking up around here. Yeah. And and I think that uh, th that's an – it's a – interesting trap that I think is a very human trap to fall into, but it definitely happens early on. It's, I mean, it's a joke in the jiu-jitsu world, right? Like, oh, the blue belt that, that knows everything. Well, yeah. initially it's like, what, I know nothing and I at least think I know nothing. Then I'd learn a little bit and I think it's a lot bit. And then, you know, the more you learn, the more you go like, I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. We kind of talked about it a little bit, but uh, once again, a lot of people that listen to this have never been on the mat, have never tried jiu-jitsu, but are really curious about it everybody at all positions like uh i think elon musk's kids are not doing jiu-jitsu wow. andrew yang is like they're all you know the, the world is curious wow. it's a it's a nice it seems to be a nice methodology by which to humble your ego which to grow intellectually and physically so people are curious about it so the natural question is if they're curious about it how would you recommend they get started maybe like what do you recommend the first day, week, month, year, first couple of years look like? Like, how do you ease into it and make sure that it's a positive experience and you progress in the most optimal and positive way? The first thing you can do is is simply ask yourself why, why you want to be involved. And, you know, I remember the first day that I walked into Ronan Athletics in uh, in New York City to train under um, my godfather of my son now, Christian Montes. Um, and I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I, I played baseball through high school and I wanted, I was at Manhattan College um, in the Bronx and I wanted to go and learn martial arts because it was always something that was interesting to me, but it was never something that that was I, that I knew was accessible. And it definitely wasn't really around in, in Northern Virginia where I grew up, whereas then you stick yourself in, in Manhattan and there's stuff everywhere. So anyway, I guess I didn't know what to expect. Um, I didn't know if I was going to get beat up, if people were going to be nice, if people were not going to be nice. Um, but what I began with was, I think, expectation management. And I think that that's something that uh, I would – That'd be the first thing that I would start is almost imagining what is it that I'm getting myself into because I love the martial arts with with the martial arts has given me everything in life and I, I'm so thankful I wouldn't be sitting here um, with without without that that experience that journey I, the people that I've met the places that have gone I, I could never ever have ever imagined um, and I'm just unbelievably thankful for that but I think that the thing that um, that helped me most of all was starting with going, you know, my, my mom said something to me one time and she said, uh, you know, there's two types of people in various situations. There's why and there's why not. And, you know, it's, it's understandable to have questions, concerns, things like that. Um, but uh, maybe sometimes it's a little bit easier when you're when you're younger to just trust people or just say, I don't know, uh, you know, um, but uh, we go, hey, you want to climb that rock? I'm like, yeah, why not? Let's go. 
hey, you want to jump in that river? Yeah, why not? Sure. Versus if I have to reason my way into everything, if I have to be talked into everything, a lot of times I'll talk myself out of it. And I think that a lot of times this is the thinker's disease. Um, you want to figure out what's going to happen and what you should expect to have happen before you get involved versus going using the old Bruce Lee saying, again, it's like no amount of thinking or training on the on the side of the river will teach you how to swim. You have to jump in. And there are risks associated with that. And so, uh, I guess, uh, psychological are usually the biggest ones. That's the biggest hurdle. And physical. Um, but the biggest thing that I guess I would suggest to anyone to say, well, why do you want to do this? You're like, well, I want to challenge myself. I want to learn. To, I would like to learn to fight. I want to learn to fight so that I could protect myself. And if, and if anything else, other people, if only within arm's reach. Um, I, I perceive that if I had some small degree of power, um, I generally wouldn't use it which is why I was like, yeah, I'll give it a try. I'll try to be reasonable. And, and hopefully if I make a mistake, I'll apologize to people. But basically I uh, said, yeah, I'd, I'd like to have that. And I want to, I know this is gonna be challenging and we'll see what happens. And that means that getting beat up and I didn't get like hurt, but getting roughed up getting my arm bent this way or that way, getting choked. I was like, well, this is all supposed to happen. That's no big deal. It would be like going and joining the army during peacetime. And then going, oh, I'm just doing this for a college education. You go like, okay, that's cool, man. And then all of a sudden, war breaks out, and they want to send me somewhere. And I'm like, whoa, 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 I didn't sign up for that gig. Actually, actually you did, <laughs> whether you realize it or not. You may not have thought that you did, but you did. So getting your mind right and and just going, what are my expectations for this activity? What is it that I'm looking to do? And of course, you know, you're know, you you're going into a gym. You're going into a place that you don't know people, or you probably don't know people, and you don't know the coach. And even if you do on a, hey, how you doing, shake your hand type of level, you know, 95% of my students don't know me. Not really. You know, I'll try to be polite and not annoy them too much, but they don't know me and I don't know them. Um, I understand if they don't trust me. I wouldn't trust, trust me either if I were them. But at the same time, someone has to take that leap. And one of the things that I've noticed um, as a martial arts instructor that's the biggest struggle uh, with dealing with adults, which is why a lot of people like to teach kids is because kids don't ask, don't argue. Mm -hmm. Now, that also means there's, there's all sorts of pitfalls with that sort of thing. And that can be an issue. But, you know, I guess a lot of times people get to a point in their life, you know, in their twenties, early thirties, where now I, I'm a, I'm a manager now. I know yeah. what I'm doing. I, no one talks to me like that yeah. versus like, Hey man, you go join boot camp. I don't care if you are Elon Musk, they're yeah. going to tell you to shut up and do push pushups. Yeah, and that's exactly. what's great about it. Yeah. Um, so you are taking a leap of faith into a world that you're going to be a tiny fish and you got to hope that the people um, who are, who are guiding you in that, in that journey are going to have, I can't say even say your best interest at heart because they don't even know you, but they'll they'll try to do no harm and they'll try to help you in the way that they would understand. And I guess that's, for instance, that's what I would try to do with anyone that that comes into my gym. I would try to help them in the way that I understand they need um, as best I can and as safe and reasonable a way as possible. But sometimes in a way that's going to make them uncomfortable, particularly if if physical combat and and it's not something that they've done before. Um, if they've a lot of people go in without even having played you know contact sports. And so that can be a big jump and you have to understand if, if that's where you're starting from, no worries, but you're going to have to kind of work your way to it and, and it's going to be uncomfortable and, and it'll, and that's okay. It's part of the process and you're going to have some bumps and bruises and you're not going to want to roll with that guy in the corner because that, that person's rough and they beat you up and they're yeah. like, okay, but is this a big hurt or is it a little hurt? If it's a big hurt, okay. If it's a little hurt, shh, I need, yeah, need you to exactly. soldier up a little bit. Yeah. It's such an interesting balance because to, to find, I think one of the most important things as in anything I think in life is the selection of the people that you put around you. I mean, that's true with uh, like getting married. That's true with uh, like, if you go to, if people ask me like graduate students, like your PhD advisor can, um, can be the difference. It's, it's everything. It's like you spend five years with somebody, they're going to basically define the more impact on you than anybody you marry, anybody you hang out with is a huge impact. And the same with the, the coach selection, which is like the school selection is, it's going to be really important about, in terms of like who you select will uh, define how happy, like the trajectory of your growth and how happy you are with the entirety of the experience. And yet like the the, the flip side of that is, if, especially if you have an ego, especially if you are the manager, then you still let go of some stuff, you're gonna feel like shit with the good, with the best kind of coach. That's the, that's what you need. Right. But there's a nice, there's a weird balance there to find. Like, uh, I mean, like, and everybody needs a different thing. Like I'm much more uh, uh, 
I enjoy being sort of like, it sounds weird, but like I am, you know, from the wrestling background, I enjoy feeling like crap in the sense like the coach, like be, getting beat up. I don't actually enjoy it. It's not like some masochistic thing or whatever. It, it, I know it's exactly like, what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> it's the growth. Like I like the anxiety. I like uh, feeling uh, like like shit when I go home. Like emotionally, physically, it's a gr it, like it's growth. It's a sign of growth, right? Like it's if you're not having to feel those things, you're probably in your comfort zone, which is fine. But that's not your growth zone, right? And everybody has a different threshold right. for that. And, and you, I mean, the the beautiful thing about jujitsu is like, it's also has like a yoga feel to it. Like you're learning about your body. So depending on the gym and depending on, and in fact, the coaches, the people around you within the gym, you can select little groups too, kind of like mm -hmm. the people with who you roll. Like if you're a smaller person, it doesn't mean you have to go against big people. You can go against the people who like smoke a lot of weed and they're chill, or you can go against like that crazy ripped blue belt competitor who's like out to destroy everybody. And depending on like what your mindset is, you can kind of select that. And it's a, such a fascinating journey uh, of like basically self-discovery. I couldn't agree with you more. It's, I mean, what you need cha may change over time, right? Maybe you, what you needed, to, what you need today, could change six months from now or a year from now. And that's something that I experienced. I'll, I'll use my my uh, first coach, Christian, again as a great example of someone who I really look up to and respect, and someone who who helped me a lot. Like at a time when I really needed some guidance and I needed to learn martial arts, but get into I, the Henzo Gracie's gym was right down the street from where Christian was teaching, and Christian was a blue belt at the time. It was uh, he was teaching at a place called Fight House, which is this awesome, like you know, like. 90s early 2000s you know warehouse area uh down on fashion avenue in uh in manhattan off of like between seventh and eighth and uh it was like a like two basketball courts wide but like there was the sambo guys over here there was the Kali guys over there there was a wing chun over there, there was jiu-jitsu in the corner and henzo's was one of the most famous academies in the world at that time still is and i just didn't know what henzo gracie was and I've, I mean, it's a great gym and it's a fantastic place for people to train. But I think what was right for me at the time was to, I stumbled into, a, a, you know, a, like a two person elevator up and found a place where six people trained at that time. Mm -hmm. And I had someone that, that I could, that could give me some, like, in addition to martial arts advice, like personal guidance. And that made a, that made a big difference. And then when initially we would have like competitions or like intra, intra, you know gym competitions with the sambo guys we would comp we would roll with them and like again it was great because they were just a bunch of like like russian dudes from like brighton beach and they would come down and then we would all fight and then everyone would train and we'd all drink tea and then go home and uh anyway uh what was uh, uh what was russians super, it was super it was super tough and they were like again just a tough group of people it was great and then i remember when i, I decided after like four or five months i'm like man i really want to try to take this seriously and i told christian about that and he's like well hey i think you need to do the following and it was you know like hey here's there was a guy named jeff ruth who was a uh, purple belt at the time which was a much bigger deal than it is now but it was 10 and 0 as an mma fighter a lot of amateur boxing experience super tough dude and jeff was was the best person at that time that i'd ever trained with and i just got squashed christian used to beat me up too but like jeff would just absolutely kick the crap out of me and i was like this is awesome and this was back when i was at home i went home for the summer for that and, and chris was like hey i think you should stay because i told him that's what i was thinking and this was a coach that you know when it's like it, when initially was exactly what i needed and then he's like well hey that's not what i'm doing here maybe they're going to be able to help you onto a path that's that's kind of commensurate with what your goals are at the moment and then you know that was an that was an interesting thing and i really got i feel that i was fortunate to start um at a place where my coach was able to transition roles and 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 do so comfortably and i think that that also was probably a factor of the fact that you know where he'd done some of his training prior like there have been issues with with the coach there we're like not supporting not having the support you know feeling like hey like i'm gonna hold on to my students i'm gonna hold on to my best guy or my best girl even if i can't take them where they need to go um so that was an interesting thing and just recognizing also though that the people like the same way you're an individual going into a gym and you don't know what you're getting into your coach is a person too and and he or she you know they may have been doing this activity longer than you but they're not they're not some weird little you know all-knowing god they don't know anything they're gonna they may say something that pisses you off they may bum they may yell at you they may help you they may inadvertently cause you some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of issue. And just being able to recognize that even though I, I say this to people, and I've said this to people in my gym, I'm like, you know, we're in the service industry, man, but I'm not at your service. Like, don't get it twisted. Like, I will absolutely do my best to help people. I'm there to, 
do my best as a martial arts coach, but I'm here to do my best as a martial arts coach. And I'll do my best and uh, periodically I make mistakes and I owe an apology or two and I'll try to give them out when I can. But uh, we're not McDonald's. It's not, oh, you gave me a hundred bucks so you do whatever you want in here. This is my house, this is my gym, yeah. this is my dojo, this is this is the martial arts, this is not a basketball team. Yeah, there's something beautiful about martial arts, like exactly as you said, is the coach, like in wrestling and at least collegiate, like high level wrestling is like, there's a dictatorship aspect to a coach that is very important to have. Like this this ridiculous sometimes nature of like master and so on and bowing all these traditions. There's something, it seems ridiculous from the outside perhaps, but there's something really powerful to that. Because that process of you said, why not, of letting go of the leap of faith requires you to believe that the coach has your best interest in mind and just give yourself over to their ideas of how how you should grow. And that's an interesting thing. I mean, I've never been able to really see coaches I've had as human. They're always, you always, it's like a father figure or like this, you always put them in this position of power. And I think that's, I think at least, at least for me, it's been a very, it's been a very useful way to see the coach because it allows you to not think and let go and really allow yourself to grow and emotionally deal with all the beatings. <laughs> well, they'll push you where past oftentimes where you would have stopped yourself, right? Which is great. And, and hopefully they know they if they're paying attention and they're, they're still a person, they can make mistakes. But they'll push you further than you would have gone, but not so far that it's not facilitative, right? Right. That's something that I can say, like Faraz Zahabi, um, the head coach at TriStar, my head coach for MMA, Kenny Florian, one of the other head coaches for MMA, have both been phenomenal influences. Paul Schreiner, who's the uh, one of the assistants at Marcelo Garcia's academy, um, coached me in jiu-jitsu for a long time, brilliant instructor. They, they've all been able to do that. And I think what's interesting about all of those guys, they're very sharp, but they, they're they very intuitive as well. And I think that Faraz actually uh, you know, told me about something that John Wooden said, John Wooden, the uh, legendary UCLA basketball coach. Just a simple philosophical idea. Just he said, some people's life is a bowl of shit. It needs some whipped cream in it. Some people's life is a bowl of whipped cream. It needs a little bit of shit in it just to balance it out. And it's an interesting thing. Coaching everyone the same way doesn't work. You know, that's I think the difference between a coach and an instructor. And a lot of times people think they want to coach, but they really want an instructor. I'm like, hey, Lex, tell me what to do, not how to do it. Yeah. And then other times people think they want, you know, an instructor and they really want to coach. And I'm like, man, this guy's just giving me information. A coach is so much more than an instructor. And that's a huge leap. And that's something that I think that people need to understand when they're going into martial arts. And I understand, and I can totally grasp why they don't, because how, how would they know? But, uh, I think about this a lot, like me giving you $150 for a month, which is not nothing, that's for sure. That does not, that pays for instructor really. Coach is a relationship that gets developed because can you imagine like just the amount of in, emotional investment and and time thinking away from from like, oh, Alex isn't here anymore, but what can I do to help him? What does he need? Yeah. Like that's that's serious. And that's the difference between, that's that's oftentimes the difference that at, at getting getting over the hump in various situations. So it's a, it's an interesting, you know, bargain that's being made, like commitment by the by the instructor who becomes a coach, commitment by the student, you know, it, like there's a financial transaction. There's a lot of things going on there, but I feel very fortunate to have had not just instructors in my time, but coaches. And that means sometimes we've butted heads. And all, sometimes I look back and I think I was right. And other times I look back on my own, no, they were definitely right. But there was always the trust um, with the exception of, of one time that I feel that trust was greatly betrayed, um, that rightly or wrongly, whether mistakes, mistakes will be made, but Everyone is attempting to do do the right thing. Under no circumstances would I intentionally do anything malicious, you know. Versus, hey, I might have done, I might have burnt your house down, but you can be darn sure it wasn't on purpose. And I think that as long as there's that mutual understanding and mutual belief of goodwill, which again doesn't just magic up out of nowhere, I, I understand. I think that that's when then great things can happen. And I look at all the athletes that I know, uh, you know, the guys and girls that I've watched become fantastic in various places. Almost invariably, they, it never happened alone. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really torn about that. Like, um, maybe you can help. Have you seen the movie Whiplash? Mm -mm. So it's, uh, it's. I would say from an outsider's perspective, people should watch it. It's a, it's a I guess, jazz band. For, it's a movie about a drummer and uh, the instructor. And he, it's a basically, a, I would say, from the outsider's perspective, it's a toxic relationship, but he's really tr the coach, whatever we call him pushes the the musician the drummer to his limits like to where he just feels like shit 
um, emotionally. It's a, it looks like a toxic relationship, but it's one that ultimately is very productive for the improvement of the musician. I have the same, like in my own experience, I had, um, I got a chance to train at a couple of places regularly. And so one of my coaches uh, who is a great human being, a lot of people love him, but when I was a blue belt, he was pushing me a lot for competition. And every time I stepped on the mat, I was uh, uh, anxious and almost afraid of training because of like the places I'm gonna have to go. <laughs> and then the, I can't, I don't know what's good or bad because I think I've become a better person because of that experience. Like I needed that. And on the flip side, like the place I got my black belt from, it's Balance Studios, is I remember also a blue belt, uh, the coach sitting down and I was going to competition and he saw something in me where he said, um, you know, like good luck, but win or lose, we always love you. Like I, I really, I remember that because I really needed that at that time. Like I was putting so much pressure on myself. Like I'm not an actual professional competitor. You know, I just competed. Like I'm a PhD student. Like, but like it was clearly having a psychological effect on me, and that's what a great coach does. Is like. You know, it's like life is more important than jujitsu since it's sure. bigger. So they find you use jujitsu when you need it to grow as a person, and when it overwhelms you, you 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 have to pull that person out. Like look at the bigger picture. Always look at the bigger picture. And it's fascinating, and I don't know what to make of it. I I don't think I would have it any other way. Is both the anxiety and the and the love. I, yeah, I think that uh, I couldn't. That's a really interesting thing that you're describing that. I, I guess it kind of brings me back to a lot of the other things we've been discussing is just almost like the the reciprocal nature of everything where no pressure, that's great. Everyone's happy all the time. It's either, I mean, let's uh, use an example of sci-fi movies. Let's say The Matrix, which of course the first one was amazing and then each subsequent movie made the series worse. But um, but basically- They're working uh, on a new one, by the way. Yeah, I've heard. We'll see. I was hoping for the best. But um, but basically, uh, you know, it's like, hey, we, we started, we, our first initial world, Agent Smith says to Neo, he's like, our first world was a utopia where everyone was happy and nothing ever went wrong. It's like your primitive cerebrum rejected it. And I think that there's obviously, I mean, what, what do I think? But I guess, well, I'm here, so I might as well say what I think. Um, I guess, uh, you know, great things are fantastic. A, a, a kind, gentle place is fantastic. And this is, again, why I love Dune, because I think Dune does such a great job of, of expressing, Frank Herbert does such a great job of expressing, again, the reciprocal nature of these ideas. You know, look at uh, look at Sparta, for instance, or at least what, what I understand of Sparta from the reading and also watching 300. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's and a, reading a, the Wikipedia article. And reading the Wikipedia article about the movie, yeah. not the uh, place. <laughs> um, but uh, it's um, that's a hard, brutal place. And that was there benefit to that? Like, absolutely. Was there a drawback to that? Absolutely. Is it sustainable? I should, I would think probably not. Um, I mean, granted, it hasn't sustained, but I mean, that type of a of a thing, it it burns too hot almost, and it uh, it it destroys the host at a certain point. And you know, I guess that that type of unforgiving nature, but entirely entirely permissive, has its own issues. And I guess coming back to your what your description of like describing a toxic relationship is a very dangerous and tricky thing because it's almost like a it's like bird's eye view me it's like you know you see let's say a husband and a wife arguing and you're like all right well sort of somebody hitting somebody i need to keep myself out of this because i have no idea what i'm seeing something but i don't know what's going on or why specifically and again short of it going to a place that's that just out, out of bounds i don't know who's right here I don't know who's wrong, and I don't know what phase of this things are in. So I, I guess and, and long term, what's good for yeah both people, right? It's, it's dangerous for. So if I want to put my finger on the scale, I can understand the, the desire to do. I'm like, hey guys, let's break it up. Yeah, but and that may be the right thing at the time, but at the same time, I'm not sure. So I think back to all of the times that you know that like you mentioned, your coach is pushing you when it's very very hard, and then other times going like, hey, let's put it in perspective here. I think that's an interesting thing for high performance. And I think that we're seeing that again, societally, you know, now, or at least maybe that's it just pops up on my internet feed periodically. Um, but 
coaches shouldn't be allowed to do this or yell at this person to yell at that person. I'm like, well, have you ever been, go to a boxing gym. It's not a commercial entity, not really. Like a real boxing, not LA boxing, not a UFC gym, like a real place. You're going to see what things are like when it's entirely performance-based. Go to wrestling room at a high level. You know, again, there's there's left and right limits, and there are such things, obviously, as abuse, of course, but and that should never be tolerated. Um, but th it's not a commercial entity. I don't need to be sweet to you if you're if you're screwing up, if you're dropping the ball, and in fact, recognizing that I'm not doing you a favor or the team a favor by by being permissive of that type of behavior, I, I think is important. Everything in its context and at its time is important. And I guess I can think again of the times that I've been on, put put or had put on me like a great deal of pressure to do X, Y, or Z or to succeed um, or to push for success. And I can't look back fondly enough on those times. They were tough at the time, but without that, I'm not sitting here. Without that, I don't go from growing up in a, in a, a very nice family in the suburbs to fighting at the highest level in jujitsu, gi, no gi, and now in mixed martial arts, starting a career at age 27. You know, I, I don't, it just doesn't happen because people generally speaking from that background don't get pushed hard enough physically to be able to make that transition. And that has benefits and it has drawbacks. You know, when you stare into the abyss, it stares back. And I think that that's an important thing to understand. You know, you stare long enough, you you can become something that you don't that you would be sorry that you did. You don't look enough, and you don't have perspective either. You know, and I I think that that's an interesting thing. I can speak to someone who's relative to being someone who's relatively articulate and reasonable. I try to be reasonable, but you know, I'll say in sparring, if people get crazy with me, they get a warning, and then I'm gonna crack them. And what did they expect? Oh, they hear the guy on a on an interview, but who did they think they were meeting? Because there's yeah. also the guy in the ring. And there's layers there too. I remember training with you. It's it's kind of funny. There was like oh. there's <laughs> well, you didn't know who I was. I mean, you still like you I have a really I, good straight ankle out, by the way. <laughs> yeah. That so I, I don't remember what rank I was, in but purple? it might have been purple or something like that. And I did some like I you had this look on your face, which I've often seen in black belts. It's like here he goes again. Like <laughs> here, here's him trying this thing. And then when I kind of annoyed you a little bit with it, now I get that it was a good, like I, you know, I did something somewhat effective, like some, like maybe a little bit off balance. Yeah. There's, a, I just peeled off a little layer of Ryan Hall to where I was like, okay, let me, let me like, there, there's like layers to the, underneath Deep Ogre, down, are like Mike onions. Tyson somewhere in there. Like, so it was like, okay, this like new guy rolls in here. He thinks he can do this stupid thing. And then, and then you started to beat the hell out of me. But the, the, the point is there's layers here from the guy who is being interviewed now to like Genghis Khan. <laughs> but it's, but it's, <laughs> it's funny, all in the same body. Right. But it's like, all of us are like that, right. Yeah. In various different directions and recognizing that's okay. It's just, there are consequences to all, every choice that we make has a consequence. Sometimes there's like objectively wrong or objectively right. But at least in my mind, that's a pretty small box. Yeah. Everything else is just, there's a consequence to that. Do you like that consequence? Do you not? And who do I want to become? What do I want to try to hone myself or anyone else into? And also, like, but this is something I've screwed up as a coach plenty of times. You know, like if someone says, if you're, if like I come to him like Lex, I really, really want to take you know research very seriously. Like, okay, I believe you. Now I haven't shown you that, but I, but I believe you. Like, okay, and now me not showing up to research or to study or not being up until three in the morning thinking about this is no longer acceptable. There was a time, like five seconds before me making that statement, that if I went to bed without reading the book that I needed to read, no worries. But the second that I made that statement, your your expectations for me changed. And maybe it's something that's something that I've screwed up a whole bunch of times in my um, as a teacher, because it's an interesting thing. Obviously, you know, being a like running a martial arts school is as you're principally an athlete um, is sometimes I don't pay enough attention to what people are doing. I just go, oh, okay. You say X, Y, or Z. I'm like, Roger that. I believe you. Cool. I will now put you in category X. And whether rightly or wrongly, like maybe this person didn't understand what they were asking for, or I didn't express this or the other, and it just, it caused cross wires. And then most of the times you just, you hash it out, you have a discussion, you figure out, get to the bottom of what people are trying to do or what they want. But uh, if I was paying more attention, I think I could have been a lot more effective, or if I had more experience. And sometimes maybe I'm not sharp enough, or I don't, I'm not perceptive enough to be able to, to see what's going on. And maybe with years more down the line, I'll be able to have a sharper perception. But uh, I think that's another one of those interesting things that 
some that sometimes I would caution or not caution, but just uh, inform a prospective martial arts student, depending upon where you're going. Um, you know, this, you, both you and also your coach or other people in the room, they wear many hats. And sometimes there's a, I had the wrong hat on. You were talking to me as Lex, the guy, I didn't realize you were talking to me. I thought you were talking to me as Lex, the guy. I didn't realize you were talking to me as Lex, the martial artist. I'm like, oh crap. Yeah. I was talking to the wrong person. So it's almost like if you had a, like I, I run my gym with my wife, she's a black belt. So she's my wife. She's my peer is as a martial artist, uh, in jujitsu. He's like, here by the way in judging. So exactly. All right. Well, all right. So, but but a uh, fellow black belt, and I guess like another. She doesn't thing, have a microphone, so you can't hear all the trash she's talking. Exactly. So. But th it can be tough, and that's something we've had to work through a lot. And it's like looking back, and it's like now being where I'm at now, and it's easy for me to say that because she's in the room, and, and I don't want her to stab me. Just continue to slowly <laughs> poison me over time. <laughs> yeah. Um, which, frankly, I understand. Um, you know, it's it's the sort of thing that that is now way more effective than anything else I could really reasonably expect to have. Um, but there were times when when both of us you know, we're justifiably annoyed at the other because of crossed wires. And sometimes, you know, you just have disagreement anywhere, misunderstanding anyway. But again, like I've, I coach some of my friends. I've coached, I've coached my friend who I've known since I was four years old. You know, sometimes I don't go, Hey buddy, how you doing? Sometimes it's like, what the fuck are you doing? Put your hand over there. How many times have we talked about this? And then you walk away and you can see him look at you crooked. And you're like, oh crap. Oh yeah. He thought I was talking to him as his friend. Yeah. Well, all right, let, we need to talk this one out, hashing out and not he's wrong. How could he possibly think that way? I'm like, oh no, I totally understand that. But if I was 22, I'm like, doesn't he know I'm a purple belt? Yeah. Some nonsense like that. And it's, and it doesn't come from a bad place, but it's just, I guess that comes back to society, to anything. People only have the perspective that they have and the awareness that we have. And so again, going back and going, hey guys, Grace, like I don't expect, it's not fair for me to go, I fight UFC. Why doesn't this guy who came in as an attorney understand how hardcore this needs to be? I'm like, how could he? Yeah. And at the same time though, if, if I'm using the language of someone that is interested in at least performance from a martial arts perspective, I understand how that could be off-putting, let's say for instance, someone that's like all of that would be out of bounds in their normal workplace. But if they think of the gym as my office, then whether they agree or disagree with what's going on, they go, okay, I hear why, I see why that might've happened. Let's talk about this. And we can, again, all push forward in a positive direction that benefits, I guess, everyone's journey throughout the activity. And now, on top of all that, there's moods. Like oh, yeah. I, I mean, especially lately, uh, I think two days ago, maybe yesterday, no, two days ago, I've never been that cranky in my life. I think, I, I don't know what it was, but I wanted, to tell everybody how much they annoyed me. It was like, I, I was just very conscious of this feeling of like, why, why is this happening right now? So I consciously decided, as I usually do in those cases, to not say anything to anybody. How do you and, do that? Uh, <laughs> well, I, you know, it's, uh, it's, yeah, meditate because it's not, I, I tend to, I tend to then visualize what's going to happen in the next, like, how is this going to make my life better? Like, if I say something that mean to somebody else, I have uh, just started a conflict that will just escalate, will continue, will add more conflict to my life. It will make things, I just don't, like the feeling it will create. And so you live in lo enough life to know that like, uh, it's just like with like street fighting. You know, I, I, I would get into a lot of fights when I was younger, just uh, on the street. But, the, but then you realize like, it's not a, like a jujitsu match or something like that. It's not, it'll escalate. It'll, it'll might come back at you. It'll, it'll like that person might find you again, but more importantly, the anxiety of it of having created little enemies in this world distorts the way you see the world. So I've noticed that like, if I am shitty to people on the internet, which I haven't been, I think in a long time, is like, it, it somehow brings the shittiness to you more and more, it escalates. Like the more love you put out there, the more like the people who put love out like surround you. Well, you mentioned forgiveness as well. Like yeah, you said, forgiveness. You, like I guess back to the original, you know, the Holocaust survivor scenario, where you're like, oh my God, like you think of the ultimate in in like, I've never experienced one one billionth of that level of, of pain and horror. And, and it's like, and I can't let this little thing go. You know, I, I guess that's an interesting thing. I think you're just making the point in your personal life, I guess the same way, right? Yeah, there, yeah. And on the internet, it's hard. I've somehow gotten, I mean, you've, 
you've had a level of celebrity for a while. I've recently gotten some level of like celebrity and like these people who are just shitty for no reason come out from all from all places like calling me a, a fraud or anything else. I you mean, it's Jay and Silent Bob strike back. They find out a movie is going to be made about them and people are talking shit on the internet and they're like, what's the internet? And then someone shows them and they're like, what? And they go to a message board and they go to Hollywood to try to stop it from being made and they eventually get money for their likeness and they use the money to buy plane tickets and fly around and beat the shit out of all the people that talk bad about them. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's, uh, I'm, I'm having trouble with it because there's people like, yeah, there's, you know, there's posts and forums and like heated discussions about is Lex Friedman a fraud? I don't know. <laughs> what has he really done? And there's like, and then there's people like, well, I think he's an all right guy, but I'm not sure. Like, <laughs> like the, there's like literal discussions, and I'm like, a, like, a, a no, nobody. Like, if you increase the level of celebrity, there's going to be like one of the things that hurts my heart a little bit is like some level of toxicity around Joe Rogan, for example. There's like communities of people that now, like, talk about him selling out, for example, all that kind of stuff, and. I don't, you know, and Joe, I've talked to him about it, is amazing that he uh, he says don't read the comments. He legitimately doesn't read the comments. His heart and his soul doesn't give a damn about the comments. All he gives a damn about is his friends. Like one of the things that's really inspiring to me, and that's, I've had a conversation with him offline about Spotify and uh, the removed episodes. People are curious What's for me. Spotify? About, um, it's uh, it's a thing on the internet where uh, I think you can play Taylor Swift songs on. Um, I'll write that down. <laughs> but you can also now play Joe Rogan podcast. Oh, cool! <laughs> and they gave him a hundred million dollars, so that that's um, you know that's that's awesome. Good for Joe. It's yeah. Uh, but the thing I've had a discussion with him, and I made a video about it that I took down because of the toxicity is like it's hard to put into words, but he will give away the 100 million in a second if he ever has to compromise who he is. Like he doesn't, I mean, he already said, as he talked about, he's made quote unquote, fuck you money a long time ago. He doesn't need any more money. He doesn't care. It's, it's nice to have money, whatever, but like he'll give it away. So the, it's nice to see when people like him at a level of celebrity, level of success and financial success don't change at all. They're just the same thing that makes you happy is talking, in his case, talking shit with his friends, in the case of most of us really, just, just hanging out with friends, doing the things you love. In his case, doing the things he loves without any, like, you know, the Texas way, the uh, freedom, like without any corporate bureaucracy bullshit that rolls in and says, well, maybe you shouldn't say fuck, you know, like more than 20 times a podcast or something like that. Like those kinds of like rules, like people, like he says, in a suit and tie that show up and say stuff. Um, Oddly enough, people that could never have done what, what he's he does. Done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's kind of inspiring to see that. And uh, I, I hope people... I, I hope people realize how special of a human he is. He's inspired uh, like people like me, like I'm just, I'm a scientist, right? So he inspired somebody like me from a very different walk of life to be like kind to others, to be open-minded. I don't know, that uh, is a special dude. So like people need to support that and treasure that as opposed to, uh, as opposed to be toxic about it. If, I mean, what, uh, I, cause people really for a long time have told me that it would be awesome if Ryan Hall's on, goes on Joe Rogan. I definitely think that would be an awesome thing. Have, have you listened to Joe? Has he been a part of your life in some kind of way? Um, You know, well, Joe's always, I've, I remember watching Joe on Fear Factor when I was a little kid, which is cool. So I've actually gotten a like from a from a bird's eye view, watch, you know, his his kind of just path through life. Yeah. But one of the things that that I always appreciate, and again, I, I barely know Joe other than to shake his hand. He interviewed me after the uh, briefing in the ring after the BJ Penn fight. Yeah. But um, one of the things that I've always admired about Joe is that I think he had fuck you money from the start. I think that zero dollars is fuck you money for Joe. I think, and that's something I respect about him a great deal. 
um, because as you say, it's interesting to watch. It's like you you hope that uh, George St. Pierre is like this. It's really neat. I, I'm not super close to George, but we're teammates at TriStar, and, and he's never been anything but a gentleman. And he's one of those people that if you didn't know George was famous, when you walk into the gym, you'd have no idea. He's not holding court, not doing it. He's just you know, training and he'll help out an amateur doing this. If you have a question for him, he'll help me. Like, I'm nobody, man. He'll, he, he would give me advice and train me. It was super cool. And he didn't kill me, which I really appreciated. He's a gentleman. But, uh, you know, it's like you you meet someone and you go, man, I'm so, it's so cool that this is the guy who's the yeah. best, that this is the guy who, who's been successful. And then you go, well, why are they successful? Like I said, true to what they're doing. They haven't changed. They're the same as they've been. And I remember I got to TriStar in 2012 and George was already, already, George St. Pierre. But I remember watching and talking to people and they're like, oh man, George is the same as he's always been. And it's neat. I see him in the gym training now and again, giving advice now. And it seems like Joe has always been consistent. And it's neat to watch someone not compromise on their values and not change who they are and not, you know, periodically like, you know, again, we all make mistakes. Like you have a bad day or this or that and an apology needs to be issued or even my bad or this or that. And you're like, yeah, and they just move on. They're not afraid to be themselves and they're not afraid to be wrong. They're not afraid to make a mistake. As you, as you mentioned, open-minded. And so I'm like, so what are the correct beliefs to have about this that I know going in, everyone's going to be okay with what I'm saying, which is usually the beginning of a conversation that's going to go nowhere, right? And uh, it's it's neat to see um, the things, I guess, that he's created on his own as a result of the authenticity that's there. And it reminds me of like Dave Chappelle. And, and, a, and again, I don't know, I've never met Dave, but it's neat to see someone that's clearly, again, authentic in their own way, doing their own thing. And they're, because of that, they're above the corporate nonsense. But what's funny, I think the message behind all of it is, hey guys, we all are. I can't promise you that I'm going to have money. Joe couldn't promise you that he's going to have money. Now it ended up working out, but he was above that nonsense from the jump. And he just continued to be above it by never giving it any mind and just going like, yeah, I'm going to be a reasonable person. I'm going to try to learn. I'm going to try to grow. And uh, if I say something annoying, you can come and talk to me about it. We can get to the bottom of it. And I'm like, if I need to say my bad, thanks, appreciate it. You know, I will. And if I don't need to, I'm like, hey, I still appreciate the talk. Thanks, man. I'll shake your hand and we carry on and we go our separate ways. And hopefully I'll treat you with respect. You treat me with respect. And, and that's about it. And I guess I think it's a lesson that it can work out no matter what, you don't have to kowtow to like these weird powers that be. Yeah. And whether you're at this level or at this level, but you can live your life the way that you want. And as you mentioned, talk shit with your friends, hang out, be happy. And it just so happens that that resonates with people. It actually reminds me of like, uh, speaking of MIT and being in Boston is like a goodwill hunting. You know, like, again, that's what did he really want to do? He could have gone this way, could have gone that way. And it was an interesting story, but it's like, this person wants to hang out with his buddies and wants to do other things. And again, happens to be brilliant and happens to be able to do all these other things. But there was, it, it, I guess it's like, at least in my mind, a story of authenticity as well. And it was both the same thing in the Robin Williams character. And I, I just think that that's a message because watch, watching things occur on the internet as they do now, things, so many things playing out in the public eye. I feel like so many private or otherwise formerly private discussions and disputes and, and you know interactions now become they all have a, a, well, what is this going to say when it goes public? So how can I couch what I'm saying? Or how can I word this in a way that's going to get people on my side or use the right buzzwords or not use the wrong buzzwords? And it, it's just neat to see people, you know, in their own way, flip the bird to that, because I just think that that's, that's just not how a human being is meant to think or interact. I'm curious what you think about the thing that recently has you know, me like hosting this podcast, I sometimes think about like, who should I talk to and not in terms of like, it's the the old Hitler question. Now Hitler, I would definitely talk to because oh, post World War II, because everyone knows he's evil. The question whether you talk to Hitler in 1937, like when people who are really students of what's going on understand that this is a very dangerous human being. Uh, but a large number of the part of the world, they're like, well, he's a leader who cares for Germany. So the question I have, it's interesting to me, it involves a particular person named, uh, who also lives in Austin, Texas, named Alex Jones. I don't know if you're familiar with the guy. I am familiar with Mr. Jones. <laughs> Uh, I've actually recently just listened to Infrawars, like one episode of his uh, show, I guess, that he does every day. And it, it kind of reminded me of a time in college when I drank too much tequila. Like there, there's no turning back. Like no. 
it's like <laughs> like the the mistakes you make that like it, it it it's i mean you don't know where you're gonna wake up you don't know who you're gonna kill or or, or not kill or steal or rob it, it it's it's unclear so that that it felt like i was getting pulled into a dark place where pretty much everybody is a pedophile that's trying to control the world so bill gates definitely is a pedophile yeah. um uh, everybody in power anybody in power there's a kind of a deep skepticism about power and a conspiratorial way to see the world where everything is like dark forces in all corners it's like the way you feel when you're a kid that there's a monster hiding in the closet which is also why you leap over the bed from like four feet away yeah, there's a strategy yes so but he says that you're just being weak you need to look under the bed under the bed there's monsters and we need to be aware of them because they're growing they're multiplying you should be and they're touching children they're touching children exactly so it all connects but the the I, when I listened to him and I thought about like, do I want to talk to him on this podcast, for example, when I listened to his conversation with Joe Rogan, the two times he talked on there, to me, it was somehow entertaining. Like it was fun to listen to. It's fun to listen to a madman go on for four hours because it's almost like theater. Um, like this is what I, I talked to Joe about when people try to censor Alex Jones, Joe says that the people who try to censor him don't give enough credit to the intelligence of human beings to like understand like that, like what a person says on a large platform does not necessarily, is not the truth. You can be a madman and say crazy things and people are intelligent enough to hear uh, certain things being when they're said like the earth is flat they can there can be intelligent enough not to all of a sudden start believing that the earth is flat like they they're intelligent enough to sort of select different ideas and be able to enjoy the theater of a particular ridiculous over the top conversation without being sort of influenced the way they start believing uh, like toxic set of beliefs now there's a lot of sort of um uh, other kinds of people, especially now with cancel culture, that say, well, you don't want to give platform to crazy people that, that ultimately whose beliefs might lead to dangerous consequences. Like, and I see it very often now with conspiracy theories that go, that go like way too far. Like for example, with, I, I'm not, I haven't looked into it, so I'm sorry, I will look into it, but uh, it hurts my heart to see that on Bill Gates, in my opinion, the person who has saved and improved more lives than probably any human in history, literally, because of the money he's invested in helping, like just, just the work he's done on like malaria in Africa, the number of people he's helped is huge. And yet every interview, anything you see now on Bill Gates, Everyone is calling him, I believe, haven't looked into it, but I believe everyone's calling him a pedophile. I don't know the full structure of it, but it's uh, it's just a very, it feels like an army of like, it feels like it's hundreds of thousands of people. That's what it feels like. It might be a much smaller percentage, but it feels like a huge number of people are calling him a pedophile. So that's the, that's the flip side. If you allow, if you give platform to conspiracy theories like that, then you start to have bigger and bigger percent of the population believe in these crazy things. I just, I wanted to put it out there because I don't know what to th think of that. If you put yourself in Joe Rogan's shoes, if you put yourself in my shoes, if you put yourself just in your own shoes. I mean, I'm, even, shoes, I'm in my shoes right now. Great, if you're staying in your shoes, just stay in your shoes. Can I have yours? Would, <laughs> would, you, would you talk, would you give platform to people like Alex Jones? Would would you talk to somebody like Alex Jones, or or not? Uh, I, I yes, I would, and I feel very strongly about this. Honestly, um, well, I think that it's it's an interesting thing, and, and I I would just say a lot of times um, I can understand you know very very clearly why people would take issue with the idea of I, I guess what they perceive to be amplifying this man's voice, this man's reach. Um, you know, as, as a demonstrable negative. But I think 
um, you know, when you take a step back further, uh, the, the cure is more damaging than the disease and significantly so. Um, I guess I, I think that I, I'm very, very wary of, I think being where you mentioned Alex Jones being wary of power and people with it. That's a lot of times there's a lot of truth and validity to crazy things that people say. It's the conspiracy theories that stick are the ones that sound credible, at least quasi credible in some aspect. And it's almost like, it seems to me like an anchor in people's mind. And it is also funny to me, obviously, the the Bill Gates, it's funny to tar people with things like pedophile, racist, rapist. Like these are things that we're basically trying to pick words that no one can ever support someone who does these things. Yeah. And that's, you know. And that changes year by year. Like oh, currently yeah. pedophile is totally in as a thing to call somebody just just as a, it used to be communist or Marxist. Yeah, Cleveland Browns fan, you know, like, come on. You know, who would want that? <laughs> Actually, nobody likes the Browns, so yeah, I'll agree I with felt you. That, that was, that's why I picked them. That's the trick, is you <laughs> yes. find a p group of people that nobody likes. <laughs> no. we all, we're good here? All right, that's the move. But uh, yeah, that's a creepy thing, though, because that is that is the creepy thing. It's like, uh, it, it, people are always looking for, groups of people are always looking for, and I find this really deeply disturbing, um, like, hey, so who's the guy that we can all get away with you know, just treating like dirt. Who's the guy that I can be a dick to? I can just walk up and punch in the face and no one's going to say anything. Yeah. And it's even if I, you know, people do that with, whether it's literal Nazis or someone that I called a Nazi, you know, I guess what's the bigger issue, this person's ridiculous beliefs or what I'm doing. And you mentioned Hitler before, and obviously Mein Kampf being a, you know, a, like the outline for some of the things he did later and when the evil was it always there? Did it, did it take root later on or flourish later on? But was, was Adolf Hitler a problem because he had crazy ideas or because he did things? I think it's because it's not, I think, I know it's because he did things. Now, if I'm going to start punishing thought crime, I, I'm going to have to start punishing thought crime. And that's a terrifying concept. Even if I'm right about the certain, about the objectively correct, about the things that I decide to call out of bounds, who put me in charge and made me arbiter of good taste? And how long until I decide that something else is is out of bounds? It's it's always a sliding scale or it's always a, a sliding standard. And I, I find that that you know, to be more of a concern than people doing crazy things. Because I guess if you mention Alex Jones, you know, putting out ridiculous, ridiculous ideas, ridiculous theories, I think that most people don't look at Alex Jones as a credible person. Now, I'm not going to pretend to be deeply read into all of his beliefs or the things that he's trying to peddle. Um, but there's plenty of things that are quasi mainstream that I think on with this side or that side, that maybe not comparably ridiculous, but are yeah. You know, particularly in hindsight or, you know, or we're not, or, or silly. And I guess uh, the idea of, of getting a group of people together to decide what we're not going to tolerate is a very, very tricky thing. And, and I think that, you know, it reminds me of law or, you know, even, you know, religion when it gets to like, what are the things that we don't like? How do we feel about rape? It's like, no, under no circumstances is that an acceptable behavior. Murder. No, that's not acceptable behavior. Killing, I don't know, kind of depends on the situation. Are you at war? Were you justified? Were you acting in self-defense? Okay, so it's not, now murder is a specific type of killing. The same way, you know, other things should be a specific type of something else, but I guess we, we draw the line on murder. We say, if you want to exist in our society, you can't do this. This cannot be done. And then we go, theft. If someone said, hey, I murdered that guy, can you understand where I'm coming from? I might say, yeah, I'll hear you out. Doesn't mean that I think you're right. But I'm like, have you ever been wronged so deeply that you could imagine that you could kill someone? I'm like, no, I haven't. But I could conceptualize someone doing that. And I'm like, yeah, okay. And you still need to go, you still need to face, you know, criminal justice as we have it in our system. Or at least that's how we've decided. Yeah, there's. But, it's, it's interesting. You have to be able to, like, there's, if you look at the history of discourse in this country, I think it's still true, but I'm not sure it's changed since 9-11, is uh, it used to be impossible to criticize um, a soldier. It, it was easier to criticize war. It was harder to criticize soldiers for allowing themselves to be the tools of war. I tend to be, maybe it's the Russian upbringing, it's the, I, it's the combat thing. I tend to romanticize war and soldiers. I, th I see soldiers as heroes. But I've also heard people that not only say that soldiers are, uh, war is bad, they say soldiers are bad. 
What's their argument? It's it's the kind of a libertarian view that they're basically slaves to evil, right? War is evil, and they're they're giving they are suspending their moral and ethical like as like duties as a human being to become the tools of evil. That's the sort of the argument. If you see war as evil, I mean, I think it's useful to hear that, but there's for a long part in history that was completely unacceptable. Same with abortion. If you see abortion as murder, I mean, if I classify it in that, if I put it in that in that basket, it starts. We're living in the midst of like a genocide. <laughs> <laughs> looked at from that perspective, could you feel how people could be deeply upset by abortion? You go, of course. Looked at from a different perspective, you say, I don't believe it to be murder. That's not how I see it. Then you go, oh, well, if that's the genesis of your, your thought process, then you're like, yeah, okay, now, now I see how we can come to a different thing. But I, I guess we go, well, abortion is murder, period. Therefore, if you support it, you support murder. Like, that's a convenient way for me to tar you, right? Uh, but I guess that's kind of coming back to the Alec Jones. I'm, the, I'm. This the nuance. It's uh, ooh. you have to have the nuance in these kinds of conversations, and I have to be willing to have the conversation, and I have to be willing to sit down. If I can't sit down across from like the most violently racist, angry, hypothetical internet, you know, conceived person that none of us have ever actually met in real life, but or hopefully not, um, you know, and go like, well. Of course, I believe that this person's wrong, but allow me to change, do my best. I'll hear them out and I'll go, no, I, I can go point by point and explain why this guy or this girl is wrong and hopefully bring them over to a more reasonable position where they will have better beliefs and they will like objectively better beliefs and beliefs that will, will and they'll treat other people better. Why would I want to marginalize this person? Now, I might not want to talk. I might not want to invite them to my barbecue if they're acting like a jerk all the time. But how could I, would it not make the world a better place if I'd hear them out and they go, look, if you're going to sit down and talk with me, we're going to have to have a discussion. I'll hear what you have to say. And if I can't, if I can't explain to someone why their ridiculous belief is wrong, then I might, I must not be so confident in my position. And I guess that's where I come back to the Alex Jones thing. As you mentioned, you know, with, uh, with Bill Gates and, and you're much more familiar with, with the specifics of all the good that he's done. But, you know, again, he's been an unbelievable force for good, you know, in this world, you can list A, B, C, D, things that the man has has done, that his foundation has done, and, you know, positive things. And then the other people could speculate about ridiculous, crazy levels of, of evil, but you can't produce any evidence for that sort of thing. Because if you could, the man would find himself in trouble, you know? And anyway, I guess what I would, would say is that why it, you can't force me to accept the truth the same way you could write down two plus two equals four on a piece of paper and show me how it works. And I could say, nah, uh, -uh. But that doesn't make it not true. And you've still given yourself an opportunity to present your case. You've presented it to me. And you've also, for anyone listening and watching, you know, you've been able to critically uh, assess what's gone on, you know, or critically address back and forth, you know, kind of the the discourse. And, and I think that you almost, you're making your case for the public. So I guess like, you know, when it comes to just never, not engaging with these people, that seems to me to be cowardly. And I think that that's a, something that we're seeing in society right now. I think, I think we're seeing a crisis of courage in society all, all over the place. And I think that's where we're seeing poor leadership. I think we're seeing you know, understandable things happening everywhere, but we need stronger voices and stronger stronger beliefs that have a conviction and are willing to engage with others, not just turn it into a shouting contest and not, I didn't win because there's more of me. Oh, I voted, I outvoted you. That's nice too, but that's a stand in for bullets. That's saying I won because there's more of me. That doesn't mean that I'm right because plenty of horrible and unpopular now things have been very, very deeply popular in the past and would have won a popular vote. Does that make them right? Yeah. I'd say clearly not. So I guess uh, you'd hope that we engage with these people and that you can do your best to bring them over to a more reasonable position if you believe that you have one. And if you can't, well, at least you made the effort. And I think that that's something where martial arts shows the value. It's like, are, do you know if you're gonna go win your next fight? I'm like, I have no idea. I will proceed forward with with f full effort and and you know I will fight with dignity, I'll fight with honor, and I'll fight with courage. And I, I'll use everything that I have and I will play within the bounds of the game and that's that. And the result will be what it'll be, but I will walk into and out of that ring with my head held high because I will know that I did my part. I did my job. The outcome, the specific outcome is not in my control. It's just strongly in my influence. And, and I think that that's something that helped me, that martial arts has taught me because other times, even when I was successful or unsuccessful, I would focus on 
if I won, I'm th I won, therefore I'm good. I lost, therefore I'm bad. This other guy won or lost, therefore, as opposed to evaluating their method. And I think it's so easy when we're taking a bird's eye view of things to not evaluate how someone's doing things. You're not evaluating my process. You're simply evaluating my outcome. And I could have stumbled into something very, very good or very, very bad. And we can look back and I think that's the value of history. I mean, I don't mean to get on my dang high horse, but it's like this the value of history is we can see the unbroken chain or the chain of events that led us somewhere. And then only with only with the eyes of history can we truly evaluate things unless we're in the room watching it happen. And I, I guess that's again where we start to go. Most of the big, bad, scary things that have happened in history that are done particularly on an industrial scale, which implies governmental power and things like that, or at least the equivalent, involve groups of people getting together and going, hey, we're not going to deal with that guy, giant groups of people. So maybe we're right this time but maybe we're wrong next time. And I, I guess I would be back to the Gandalf putting on the one ring. I would be very, very hesitant, even if we thought we were in the right, to simply try to try to marginalize just on general principle, even people like Alex Jones, who on their face are pretty ridiculous. Like you said, you should sit down with Adolf Hitler and talk to the man. I agree with you. To play a little devil's advocate, Please. is Alex Jones might be a bad example, but if we look at, because he has a face, he is a human, he's a real person. There's also trolls on the internet, 4chan. The worry I have with those folks is that, and there might be parallels to martial arts, is they practice guerrilla warfare, meaning they don't necessarily want to arrive at the truth. They just always want to cut at the ankles of the powerful. Like they want to always break down the powerful. And even if they, I mean, it's a, they turn everything into a game. So they, let's see if we can make the world, let's see if we can make a trend that Bill Gates is a pedophile, right? They make it into a game. They get excited about this game. They see the powerful. Let's see if we can convince that, like who is the most positive person we can think of? Let's see if we can turn them into evil. Mm. And they've tried that with like, with like everybody, mm. and some, and, and it seems to stick. And they're good at it. And uh, it, some would argue, or whatever you think about our current president, that he has some elements of that, which is he's figured out whatever this music of social discourse that's going on. He's figured out how to always troll the mainstream like flow of consciousness that's the the media he always kind of says stuff that annoys a very large number of people and he enjoys that mm. because it's like taking the powerful taking the way things were before and he like shakes it up by saying the most inappropriate thing almost on purpose or instinctually and so on right. the problem i have with that is that doesn't the powerful thing there is it uh brings the power, the, the those in power down a notch. That's a great thing. The negative thing is it doesn't push us closer to a nuanced, careful, rigorous discourse towards truth. It's like showing up to a party and just like starting to yell. It doesn't create a good conversation. It just makes everything into a game where truth doesn't even seem like a thing we can even hope to achieve. I, that makes sense. And I guess, as, as you mentioned, we'll come back to another movie because I don't do books and do movies. Some people just want to watch the world burn, right? And I guess there's that's a creepy, creepy, you know, kind of urge that some people have. And it also is some people you're like, hey, would you like to throw a brick through that glass window? You're like, yeah, sure. Like, no, I'm not going to do that because I think about what's going to what's going to what's going to occur. Like something's going to be hurt. Someone's property not going to do it versus, hey, you want to see what will happen? You're like, yeah, sure. You know, kids are always like, I have my son, he just grabs Spider-Man and drops him off the table. Spider-Man fell. I'm like, Spider-Man didn't fall, Sean. Like, you dropped him. You knocked him off the table. And he'll grin. And basically, uh, you know, it's it's an interesting thing, like you said, uh, like playing that pe these people are appealing to. And, you know, and, and also almost like the little dog factor of like, I, people do want to watch the powerful get taken down a notch for all the good and the not yeah. good of that. Because plenty of people... It seems to me that have found their way to incredibly high positions. Some some have just found themselves there, and many, 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 many people, you know, men and women of of all backgrounds, are brilliant and have worked hard. And yeah, of course, there's luck, and there's there's luck into everything. There, you know, LeBron James, in spite of being the best basketball player on God's green earth, is fortunate that he didn't get hit by a car. 
you know, it's fortunate they didn't tear his knee, uh, you know, but uh, thankfully we get to see all these things, you know, but, um, I, I guess, uh, it's, if people don't have any skin in the game, you never know what they're going to do. And I think that's the problem with the internet, you know, that people get to be nameless, be faceless. That's why guerrilla fighters are outside of the bounds of war. Like you don't have a uniform on. They're like, I don't know who you're from. You don't get the same treatment that a soldier gets. Um, for and people, well, that's crazy. I mean, actually, there's reasons for this because otherwise, people are able to assail things, and there's no there's no one responsible. There's no way to go and say, hey, where's where did this come from? What's the root of this? What? How can I address this? And I think that's the problem of the internet. It's the problem of Twitter. It's the problem of places like 4chan. I wouldn't I'd mind seeing that type of stuff go away if I'm frank. But that's not the same thing as people with a face. People with people who are willing to stand there and say, hi, my name is so-and-so. Even if I have ridiculous beliefs, hopefully, you know, people will hear me out. And then if I'm wrong, educate me. But uh, I, I guess you, you hope that the real, I guess, in my mind, antidote to all of this silliness is education. And and I think that that's something that we're, you know, critical thinking is is not necessarily, I went to school in America and I, you know, I feel very fortunate, but critical thinking is not something that's that's focused on. I mean, and it's, it's tough. It's almost like talking about jujitsu. It's tough to teach critical thinking when I don't know any words. You have to teach me techniques. You can't teach me to be an artist, but recognize that the techniques are the beginning, not the end. Ultimately, it's the artistry that we are searching for, not just the, not just the science or the, or the by rote memorization. And I guess, you know, you'd hope that people's ability to think critically and recognize that majority rule or whoever's loudest does not mean that they're right by any stretch of the imagination. And we don't appeal to that and we don't bow to that. Um, will help them to help inoculate them against the ridiculous things that come out of these places, these dark places that that are objectively not great. But the, I guess, all circling back, if even if we swatted these, you know, these bad things out of existence right now, we've got to be very, very careful doing that because it's who's doing the swatting. This political group that's in power right now, the people that support our current president would maybe feel a certain way. The people that support another option would feel differently as to what exactly defines toxic. And I, you know, I guess that that's what, what gives me pause. Yeah. And, but also the grace thing, I tend to believe that the, the technology, you said education, but the, the platforms we use like Twitter and the, Reddit and all these platforms have a role to play to teach us grace, meaning they in, they should help us incentivize the kind of behavior that is incentivized in real life. Hmm. Like being a dick in real life is not incentivized, like one-on-one -on -one interaction. Hmm. Like there's cases where it is, but usually being kind to each other is incentivized. On the internet, it's not. Like you get likes for being, for mocking people in a funny, in a humorous way. Mm -hmm. And it can be dark kind of mocking, depending on the community. You can go, you can go to the appearance. If somebody's a little fat or a little too skinny, you can comment on their appearance, the hair, the way their hair looks, like the appearance stuff. It could be on the people comment all the time on the uh, level of eloquence of my speech. Go fuck yourself. I like it. It's <laughs> so, creepy though watching watching previously like this used to be lowbrow though like people doing this type of stuff. It's yeah. creepy watching like our political figures get into this type of game. Yes, but again, it's a little bit refreshing, right? It's a, the my hope with Donald Trump was <laughs> is that he would shake up the the people who wear suits usually the the like if you're from D.C. I remember like showing up. I actually didn't wear what I usually wear in DC because I was like, everybody's wearing a suit and tie when I was like giving talks and stuff. Except for Mudge, who wears Except jeans and a t-shirt. Mudge doesn't give a damn. <laughs> Mudge is a, a forever renegade. Uh, but I don't even remember what, I, oh yeah. So my hope with Trump was that he would shake up that system to say like, like uh, to inject new ideas, to inject new energy. Of course, the way it turned out, is different, but like there's uh, it turns out that you might want to have somebody who's like like an Andrew Yang type character who is, is full of ideas that are very different and inject the energy, new energy into the system through youthful new ideas versus through the troll that like <laughs> that's very good at sort of mocking and like playing outside the the rules of the game. But Trump did reveal powerfully, I don't know what to think of it, that um, 
It's just a game and you don't have to play by the rules. That's both inspiring and dark. Deeply depressing, right? Yeah, and I don't know what to do with it. I don't, I mean the same, I'm not drawing parallels, not drawing parallels between our president and Adolf Hitler, but it's certainly, and there's a lot of, uh, in history, a lot of positive and a lot of negative things happen when charismatic leaders realize they don't have to play by the rules. You, you can just flip the table. It's the that uh, uh, Kevin Spacey show. Oh, House of Cards. House of Cards, where you just flip the table or whatever. You don't have to play by the rules of the chess game. You can flip the table. One wonders if that's always been done in private, you know? I guess, because that's, I mean, even look, obviously, in the United States is a, is a republic, but we had... We had Bush, then we had Clinton, then we had more Bush, then we had President Obama, then we were about to have another Clinton. That's fairly creepy. Yeah. Even on its own. But now we're, we added another, I mean, I'm sure we'll have a generation of Trumps. No. Gee. <laughs> we, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Russian, so I think we humans like kings still and queens. There's something... We're attracted to the the thing we talked about, coaches. There's something in us that longs to, towards that authoritarian control. One of the beautiful things about America, the Second Amendment, uh, is uh, we also like individual freedom. That's one of the one of the unique aspects at the founding of this country, and still, and for me, is the beacon of hope that uh, somehow there's the fire of freedom burns in the, like that Texas feel that I that gives me hope the fu energy that revolts against the power which as we discussed power corrupts and ultimately leads to sort of uh degradation of the whoever's in, ruling it's, the people it, it's interesting though like it seems to me maybe I'm just I don't know if I'm reading this properly when I when I see it but it's it seems to me that that like you said that that you know, flip the bird, I'm gonna do me within reason, like as long as I'm not hurting you, uh, is idea that that very much, at least in my mind, defines the American ideal, or at least part of the consciousness of the United States, is is under attack to a certain extent. You know, um, in if only like I can think to like, you know, maybe a generation behind us, um, it's it's becoming more collectivist. Yeah, you know, for all the good and also the not good of that. And it's uh you know, not in not in terms not, not in terms of policy at this point, but just in terms of like uh, consciousness. And I wonder if that's a an internet thing. You know, people are more in touch with one another than they've, as far as I'm can tell, they've ever been, or at least more than, than in my lifetime. And uh, you know, the rest of the world seems much closer than it did. You know, living in Virginia, California seems very far away. Being on the internet, it's just right there. I can mm -hmm. hear about it. I can see it. I can ex I can interact with people from there. You know, I remember, uh, you know, being in Tennessee at, uh, you know, one time and then re and reading about, you know, events taking place in, you know, the Middle East. And that just seemed like a mile away. It seemed like a, a, a unbelievably far distance. And then another time when you're in D.C., you just feel like, oh, you read about something happening in Paris. And it just feels like it's just right around the corner because D.C. is a seat of uh, a seat of power where things are just occurring all the time. And, uh, you know, I guess you, you wonder about that's where I come back to the group decisions to not listen to this person or to cancel this or to, you know, we all, the moral majority shall do the following as opposed to as long as you're not hurting me and as long as you're not hurting anyone else, I have to let you do, I have to let you be on general principle. Even if I don't like you, I'm very free to not like you. I'm free to speak out against you, but I'm not, it is not within my right or, and not with it. And it's not, I, I would not be right to attempt to attack you. And that is an interesting thing though, when we see words being redefined or words being defined, whether it's toxicity, whether it's violence, if I think that what you're saying is is your speech is by itself, you know, a violence or a, a precursor to violence, I'm justified in doing all sorts of things, you know? And, and that creeps me out significantly because again, even if it ends up being pointed in a good direction initially, it's only a matter of time. And actually that brings me to, uh, another D dune oh, quote? yeah i got all day um how much are they paying you but uh, well yeah about say the uh, the frank herbert estate not enough frankly <laughs> um uh, let's see and how many books are there in dune uh that's a gen question you're also a fan of Dune. i read the whole series but not a couple of the i read all the prequels as well with the exception of a couple is there a book one for dune 
Dune. It would be book cool. one and even the prequels, it's still all better if you start. Like I read Dune and then read the original, what is it, six? And then I went back and started to read some it's of like, the It's just like watching Star Wars. You, you want to start at episode four or whatever. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> that's the way. That's the move. And then stop at six. <laughs> call it a day. Watch the Mandalorian. Mandal but well, I thought you're not walking back here. No, I like the Mandalorian. Yeah, no, it's, it's not, not what, the Mandalorian. That is what I said. I, uh, uh, I, yeah, yeah, I was told that I was heartless for not liking Baby Yoda. About, who I we don't talk like, about <laughs> a couple of the movies, not including the Mandalorian. The Mandalorian's fine. It's the more recent movies that we don't like to talk about. Yeah. Right oh, now. the what's his name? The the goofy guy. Uh, Ryan. No, no, <laughs> no. The creature, the goofy creature with the Jar Jar. Jar -Jar. Yeah, Jar Jar. Yeah, Wait, do you ever see the the, the, uh, the 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 Jar Jar Binks is actually else. like the Dark Lord of the Sith theory that fixed the whole oh. initial trilogy? Where oh, like he's because he's like goofing exactly. around and like making it all the way through battles, and when you're like, wait a minute, he oops his way, and he like, walks over to a pool, does a triple backflip, falls in, and you're like. It's just bizarre so that he's you... the. This is the Alex Jones theory of of Star Wars. Yeah, well, like, also, he's he actually one, running. He everything. was the one that actually was like, "Hey, we should vote in Chancellor Chancellor Palpatine or Senator Palpatine." Like right before they put Jar Jar in charge. First off, what did they think was going to happen? And second off, <laughs> that was I would just think that'd be great. You're like, oops, oh man, I guess he's the emperor now. That would have been great. But actually, to the to the cancel and all the other stuff again, it's just like, you'd hope that it gives pause. And I think about this for fighting because a lot of times I'll use this example. People in people like fight fans and you know like ufc they love people that run out and try to murder each other and it's entertaining and it's super entertaining but you know floyd mayweather doesn't resonate with people as much it's like people start i remember the time when floyd was not as popular now people think people love floyd because he's 50 and 0 floyd and oh man and finally he had so much success that we all can't help but recognize the man's genius and greatness but prior to that oh he's boring he's this he's that he fights you know, with he's circumspect, he's cautious, he's he's pressing, he's intelligent, deeply intelligent. And uh, when you watch people go out and try to murder each other, you can you can flip a coin a hundred times, and you know you can get you could be lucky enough to get a hundred heads, but it's still a coin flip. And I think that that's what's going on all the time is you know people are getting an outcome that they want, but it wasn't a well thought out situation. And that's why you'll win by five in a row by knockout, and then lose three in a row, and then people will go, well, what happened to that guy? He used to be so great, and you're like, no, he's doing what he's always been doing. It's just it was getting great outcomes on a coin flip prior, and it's getting negative outcomes on a coin flip now. But uh, I guess what I would say is it, it watches. It's interesting watching you know I guess societal beliefs become such a a thing that we're almost adopting on a religious level if we're not careful and if if when i say religious level i mean like like pan life like this is guiding all of my choices yeah. for all the good and the bad of that and this is a dune quote is when religion and politics travel in the same car the riders believe that nothing can stand in their way their movements become headlong faster and faster and faster they put aside all thoughts of obstacles and forget that the precipice does not show itself to the man in a blind rush until it's too late and I think that that's, again, the the pause. We go, oh, man, thank goodness. We have this guy that wants to rebuild Germany. He'll put us back where we need to be. Yeah. And, and you stop questioning any your own judgment, your own... Right. Just you start, you, you stop thinking, essentially. Right, I'm not allowed to question this. Oh, well, of course this is correct. Of course this is correct. Oh, of course I'm right. I intended to do right, so of course my actions are, are correct. I mean, how many times have any of us intended to do something helpful and ended up doing something less? And, you know, plenty of people who intend to do harm could by accident do something decent. Mm -hmm. And I guess it, it's, like, you know, I'm not saying anything, you know, terribly, terribly, you know, insightful, but it's just one of those where it's hard to, it's hard to say in the moment. And that's where you, you hopefully caution, you would counsel some degree of caution. And uh, that, that's what worries me with, with people deciding that we're all so right about this or we're all so right about that and attempting to, rather than win the argument, silence the counter argument no matter how crazy it may seem because i just think that that idea even when it's pointed in a good direction initially it's only a matter of time you're amongst many things a jiu-jitsu black belt one of the things that people are really curious about white belts and blue belts in jiu-jitsu but also people who haven't tried the art is what does it take to be a jiu-jitsu black belt i think that you know, everyone's journey is a little bit different, but the one thing that the, what is it, Calvin Coolidge quote, you know, determination, persistence is the only thing that, that will win in the end. It will always win in the end. Not brilliance, not toughness, not education. It's, it's persistence. And I think that having the belief that no matter what happens to me, I will proceed forward and I will, I will figure out how to make this happen, hell or high water, 
I think is the one thing that ties together all of the people that I've ever met that made it through whatever it was that they were going through. Because, you know, sometimes you can get lucky and you can have an easy time or, and that luck could be, you had a good situation. It could be, I mean, like in the obvious sense of like where you're living, where you're training, what's going on. You had a good situation. You're un unbelievably athletic. Oh, you're a, you're going to be an astronaut. You're brilliant and, and an Olympic athlete, you know, like, yeah. well, that's a fantastic situation. You know, you won the genetic lottery and I'm sure you worked hard as well, but you also won the genetic lottery. It's a, uh, determination is the one thing though because that person could have a very easy go of it initially and then tear their knee and then they're no longer the the superhuman physical specimen that they were the only thing that will keep them going is persistence and i think that that um i would just say that persistence i say i'll just put one foot in front of the other and sometimes i can see the path ahead and sometimes it's beyond my vision but i will not stop i may even slow down but I won't stop. And that's the only thing that I can say that I've seen tie everyone together because there's so many ways to the top of any mountain and there's so many different personalities and skills and backgrounds involved, but everyone everyone carries on. So at the core, the foundational advice is just don't quit, just keep going. That's the lesson of martial arts, I think. You know, we think it's like how to be strong or how to be, how to win, but in reality, it's like how to persist, how to endure because it's, all of us have been beaten so many times and gotten beaten up so many times and thought about quitting. Have I ever thought about quitting? Absolutely. Have I ever quit? Never. I will never, ever quit. Ever. I can say that. You might not me out. I will be damned if I quit. What's the darkest moment? Is it injury related? Like, is it, is it, uh, so like to me, like two possibilities, I've fortunately never been seriously injured, but I think that's a dark place to be, like having to be out for many months uh, for, um, as Jen was saying, like with a head injury, especially like the uncertainty, that's one. And then the other side is if you have big ambitions as a competitor, realizing that you're not as good, like th those, those doubts were like, I kind of suck. How am I supposed to be a world, the greatest fighter of all time? If I, if, if like, several people in the gym are kicking my ass. Those are the two things that paralyze you. I think that everyone's darkest moment is maybe different. Looking from the outside for Ryan, I wouldn't say that he's had injuries and he's had bad ones. I wouldn't say that was his darkest moment. I think for me, I would say some of my head injury was my darkest moment. Um, absolutely, and I've torn my ACL twice. I've torn my shoulders four times. I've had lots of surgeries. Um, for me, the orthopedic injuries were not the most difficult. It was the brain injury. For others, that might be the case for them. Maybe they've never experienced a, an injury, and maybe for them, that's their darkest moment. From the outside, obviously, Ryan can speak to this more, but for Ryan, I think it was the um, inability to to perform at certain points, to the, oppor the missing of opportunities that for him from my perspective, watching him go through and having seen various points of his growth from, from early purple belt on, I think the hardest time for him looking in, obviously, was uh, when he would hit moments where he wasn't able to perform for various reasons. He couldn't get fights. He, he was having difficulties there. I think that that was the hardest point for him. Did you, did you think, like, with a head injury that you might not never be able to do jiu-jitsu again? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mine was very, um, was really bad and it was just the one hit, but I had a looping memories for seven months. Didn't know it because when your brain's messed up, you're not even aware that you're looping. Um, and so uh, I saw two different neurologists. I find like it took a very long time. Um, I didn't know if I was going to be able to have like linear thoughts or read a book. I didn't know at certain points if I could listen to music again, you know, without it making my head hurt. Um, and so, uh, it was almost two years before I woke up in the morning without a headache, um, just waking up before I even start my day. And so that- So that's even bigger than jujitsu. That's just life. That's just, that's just hard. And I think that you can experience so many things. I've had all these injuries. Um, we lost a baby when I was 15, 15 weeks. Um, we've had all these experiences and what the hardest point for me, not saying that all of those things weren't hard, but it's kind of like, as you go through these, you just realize like life goes on and you have to keep working at it and you have to keep going. And you asked me earlier offline, did I feel depressed? And 
I, not for my head injury. I don't think that at least in the moment I had a any recognition of that. It's kind of like, but I think different people's personalities, I have kind of the like buckle down and just keep going. And, and sometimes it's not until lots of time later that you realize, wow, that was really hard because you're just struggling to live and, and function and, and do the things that you need to do along do the path. Do you mind jumping on just like oh. this part of the conversation I'm just sorry, for a few minutes? I'm sorry, need to over. Do you, do you mind, you know, just sitting together? Oh, not at all. Here. Just for a little bit. Sorry it'd be about cool that. I didn't mean if, to jump It'd be cool if we put a face to it, you know? <laughs> uh, is, is it okay with you? Yeah, it's fine okay. with me. It's fine with you. By the way, what was the head injury, if you don't mind sharing? Someone hit their, had dropped their knee on the back of my head during training, who's a lot bigger than me. So one strike to the back of the head is too much for someone. There's a reason that's outlawed in MMA, right? Someone 50 pounds heavier than you drops their knee on the back of your head once and it's... That's the funny thing about getting hit, right? You never can really be sure what's going to happen. I think that's actually one of the magical parts about jujitsu, where like if you choke me, if you... We know what's going to occur. You hit someone, they might be completely unharmed. Like you might be punching Tony Ferguson in the face and like you, you need to hit him with a sledgehammer to affect this man. And then other people, they could get really badly hurt, which I guess mm -hmm. it's back to your point about, you know, street fighting and things like that and the serious, serious potential, you know, second, third order consequences of any action that we take. But yeah, that's a that's a tricky thing about getting hit. How does it make you feel that, like the, the really shitty thing about injuries to me was that like, you start thinking like, well, if I did this one little thing different, like, this wouldn't have happened today. Like one mm -hmm. one moment changes your entire life. Is that do you uh, do you think that way, or is that totally counterproductive? Um, you can't help but think that way when you've had the amount of injuries I've had. Now, because I've had more than my, most people's fair share, um, as my orthopedic says, you don't want to win that. You don't want to win the contest of who's had the most. But since you surgeries, have, but, you're building me a pool. Yeah, <laughs> um, but I think. You can't help but think that way sometimes, but I definitely don't think it's, I think it can be facilitated if you don't beat yourself up too much. Um, because thinking about why have I been subject to so many injuries and and a lot of it comes to just um, almost all of mine in particular people a lot heavier than me. So we're, I, but if I've been training martial arts 15 years, I'm obviously on the much smaller side, I'm a woman. I've done thousands and thousands of rounds with people 50 pounds plus heavier than me. I mean, years not training with anyone less than 50 pounds, which is 50 pounds is almost half my body weight. And when you also add testosterone and the natural um, physiological advantages of men, not just are they heavier with more mass, they're faster, they're more explosive, they're stronger, um, if they're the same size. And so I think that the willingness to, to be in that environment over and over and over again creates a lot of strength, resiliency, willingness to continue, but it also, like in order to do that, you almost have to, uh, for me, the way I was approaching it was like pretend like I wasn't more vulnerable um, and just be willing to step in and step in and step Fake in. Fake it until in. you make it kind Fake of thing. Fake it until you make it kind <laughs> of, yeah. Like I'll just one day, I'll be strong enough. And, and you avoided injury for most, for most for of For most of those rounds I avoided injury. The problem as Ryan points out is that like you could do thousands of rounds, but if one person that size, that strength, that hover reacts, in a way that you don't expect. It doesn't, it's not like an oops, it's like always major. Do you regret any of it? Like I think that most, no one I know has experienced the degree of injuries that I've experienced. And I started just at a time when uh, in 2005 is very different than now, where you have, the coaches have more control over what you're doing. They're more aware in general about a lot of the injuries. There's a lot more people who are uh, hobbyists than when I started. Uh, I mean, they were hobbyists, but it was different kind of hobbyists, you know, than now. Um, now our girls can train with other girls. They don't have to do thousands of rounds with somebody significantly more powerful than them. Um, and um, for the, the drawbacks and the benefits of that, you know, as with anything. Um, so I think, I think that I don't think I would go back and change it. There were times after one of my injuries where I said to Ryan, I said, I quit, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. I probably said it more than once, but there was one time I was really serious in 2012. Um, I was really serious. I had torn my shoulder. I had, I was looking at missing a big competition again in the world for two, my second or third year in a row after injuries. And I said, I'd quit my job two years before. And I'm like, 
I'm done. And Ryan, before that, had always been, you know, you keep you focused. And then he kind of said, okay, if you want to be done, be done. Just just have a good time. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm really done. I don't even want to train anymore. Like, okay, okay. And then, you know, I think he helped facilitate a moment for me to go um, visit a friend, some friends, some girls that were doing a, a girls camp who are close to my size, or some friends of mine to go train. And I was like, oh, wait, I do love this thing. It's yeah, just you, harder for me on yeah. a daily basis, but that doesn't mean I don't love this thing. And it really helped change my mind. I started to connect with other people, travel more myself, um, because previously he had done that, but I hadn't really done that. I think there was a point where um, when I started jiu-jitsu, it was just for fun. I just wanted to sport after college. I played sports as a kid. I want to. I just wanted to exercise. I wasn't into the martial arts. He used to give me a hard time about it because he was always very, how can you not care about martial arts? Yeah. I don't know. I just want to play sports. Yeah. Um, and Ryan was really big into kind of the philo- philosophy side of the martial arts aspect. Um, he used to give me a hard time. And I think after that moment, this moment where I looked at myself and I said, do I want to keep doing this? Is when I started to appreciate jujitsu. Take it took off some of the pressure I'd been feeling. I think as Ryan's girlfriend, but I had a full time job a long time. It was never my goal to be a jujitsu world champion. And I think after that moment where I looked, like, you know, I really do like this. I really do want to keep this. Mm-hmm. I had this moment like any time where you're like, I'm doing this for me. I'm not doing this for him. And I think that that's, um, I think that that was really lucky for me because. How often in our lives do we have a kind of a challenge where we have to stop and we have to say, is this really what I want? Mm -hmm. How often in a relationship do you do that? How often in any type of lifestyle or job do you stop and do you really ask yourself, is something really difficult happen that you look and you go, am I just doing this because it's convenient and easy or is this what I really want to do? Yeah, I've had those moments. Like this this podcast is one of those things is like you you stop and, and think like, I actually love this, <laughs> and it's. Uh, I had that with jujitsu too. I I don't think I had sat until like brown belt that I stop. I mean, yeah, it's when you first face real challenges, you think like, why am I doing this? It's. I think most of my progression was why not. I think that's the right the leap of faith, right. and then at a certain point you think like, what? Why am I doing this? And if you can answer. Honestly, that because I love it, it's kind of a liberating feeling. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's so, it's so powerful. It's well, an you feel acceptance. Thankful for the opportunity to be there, right? Because you love it, and you yeah. go, man, I, if yeah, it's great mistaken, gratitude. I'm, it's right. yeah, it's, oh, it's it's ultimately gratitude. Yeah. Let me ask you this. So Ryan said, like, what what, what is it? I took it? over your thing. Yeah, no, this is no no nobody cares about Ryan. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll Photoshop him out or whatever. However, you <laughs> had to do that'd be great. Just put Sean Connery's head. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, just like a Dune ad, over here. exactly. Uh, Sean Connery, uh, I could, I could get down Sean, that. Is that the sexiest man in, in uh, Sean Connery in the Dune universe? That's my understanding. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I think in any universe. <laughs> yeah, well, Ryan Gosling. Given we actually named our son after Sean Connery. Oh yeah, that's right. We did. Five notion of yes, we we did. yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was in The Rock. That was I. I love all those. Oh, those are great. Mm. Lame Nicholas, Nicholas Cage. Cage oh yeah, Con Air is probably Face the off? greatest movie of all time. Oh, Con- Dude, his accent in Con Air was so yeah. awesome. <laughs> I don't know where it's from, Alabama, I guess, or something. I love that, that they got hair. like Steve Buscemi in there. They're like, yeah. we need Steve Buscemi in this thing, and we got him. <laughs> Dave Chappelle. Like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's a prisoner oh, yeah, in yeah, eight right. ball. That's yeah. right. Yep. Greatest movie of all time. Should have won an Oscar. Dave Chappelle also in Blue Streak with Martin Lawrence. And in, uh, what do you call it, uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights? Oh, Robin Hood oh, Tights was right. one of he my is. favorites yeah. as a kid. I've baked, but Rob, Rob yeah, well, that, that's a good... That's a uh, wow, we just listed off some really bad 90s movies, but... <laughs> you take but that the, back. <laughs> we're telling our age. <laughs> yeah, you're so bad. Uh, Speak yourself. <laughs> so what, um, like, in your view, I don't mean to from like a smaller person, I guess. That's an interesting thing about jujitsu is like that uh, small, I don't, I, I hope, hopefully that's not a bad thing. Um, Elf. <laughs> and, Elves are taller. I've, yeah. Like with all these like uh, bigger people, you can still enjoy the art. Like what does it take to get a black belt to excel to quote unquote master the art? Gosh, everyone has such a different path. Ryan's promoted uh, six, seven people something like that and i think about half of them have had um 
have kids, have families, have other careers. Um, at the time, some of them competed a lot. Some of them have never competed or rarely competed. Some haven't competed in a long time. Um, some had started different places. They, everyone's had different journeys, uh, even in our own little group of seven. Um, I think only, maybe only two or three were, were high level competitors of that group, um, at the higher belts, right? Like brown, black, maybe. Um, and so, it's just different for every person. And that's something that, that, you know, we try to tell her since we have 400 students and, um, do we have a, we don't really have anyone who's, you know, a stated other, other than like the coaches like Adam, but we don't have anyone that's like a stated high level competitor as a student at the moment. We, people look at our gym like, oh, it's lots of competitors. It's not lots of competitors. It's never been lots of competitors. And we've had ones and twos here and there. Um, but really everybody's, in it for the long term, if they're in it, sometimes the the high level competitors are the ones that are more likely to drop off because they have a bit of success, particularly at at blue or purple, and then they realize how hard it is at brown and black, and then they they have a hard time continuing on that that path, and then they can't look at themselves as a non competitor. They have a hard time continuing with jujitsu, I think. Whereas sometimes it's the guy who comes in as a white belt and he trains you know, twice a week, every week. And the next thing you know, he's been there for two or three years. Like, oh, he's a blue belt. He's a purple belt. He's a brown belt. And and he's just consistent um, over over a long period of time and willing to, to take the path. And no two people's path is exactly the same. No two people's lives are exactly the same. You have, um, we have students who started as a white belt as a, you know, a young adult with no, you know, no responsibilities and they train all the time. And then they have a job, or, you know, then they graduate college, then they have a job, then they have married, then they have kids, then they have different points in their careers and at different points in your life, jujitsu will be there, you know, for whatever way that you're willing to accept it, its place, I think. Well, that's actually kind of what, back to the initial question we discussed about, you know, what makes a warrior, <clears throat> you know, and, and also like what makes something or someone, you know, particularly impressive in my mind is like uh, what they make out of what they have. Um, you know, one of my favorite movies ever is Forrest Gump, and it's obviously it's it, it's just if you can't because uh, I've heard people like, oh, Forrest Gump sucks. I'm like, I don't like you as a person, and uh, <laughs> like you have no heart at all. <laughs> but basically, uh, it, it's the story of someone that tries hard, and it's like, yeah, the, the, but it's it's a funny movie. But it's like, um, you know, I guess you, you meet each person where they are, you know, and obviously you want, everyone needs to be pushed. We all need to be pushed. We need friends and people around us that push us to be better versions of ourselves all the time. And, and as you mentioned, the people you spend all of your time around deeply impact you. Um, and we have to be willing to be pushed. It takes a leap of faith for me to trust, for me to put some of my self in my, my, you know, I guess my ability, my control, my personal agency, as it were, in the hands of someone else that I that I trust and and that I respect. But if if I can do that, well, again, maybe I never become you know high level black belt competitor. But you know, I had four of the things I was doing in my life. I also have a family. I have this. I have that. You know, what that person was able to accomplish in the martial arts relative to what they were able to put in is phenomenal. You know, other times someone could be a very successful black belt and in my mind be a bum because they could have been a lot more and you know they could have done more they could have focused more and in, there's no shame in deciding that you don't want to do that but whatever it is that you're you're invested in i remember the uh take it uneasy podcast and that i, I loved because you know i'll just chill out I like resting it's like vacation oh who wants to go on vacation yeah, i'll go on vacation for a day or two you want to spend three weeks on vacation I'm like i kill myself like get me out of here like this is horrible <laughs> this is I'm, I'm a waste of life i'm not doing anything useful Ryan you're technically vacation. on vacation right now right well this is yeah. fun though but it's like a one day vacation uh, yeah, exactly but if you know if you had to, okay, i would i'm sure you're thinking about jumping off of the building right now but if you had to if you had to talk to me for you know like uh three days i'm sure you'd, you'd probably shut me off the building i don't blame you i would be dead people but yeah five hours in but, but yeah but you know it is it's like you want want to be pushing towards something um because otherwise what's the purpose of being here you know it's not just a college it, it's doing something useful building growing as a person helping others do the same if that's within your power at any given time but i think that's kind of the neat thing about martial arts is it can be many many different things to many different people you know i finally for instance was able to get a college degree le this this year that which i mean it's not a big deal for most people but for me it was a big deal because i was you went back and finish yeah and i never envisioned ever going back and you that's know, a hard step to, to to go back and finish that's yeah. uh it, 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 it was, weighs heavy on you if you don't it's yeah. interesting yeah i was just i was more proud of that than most things i've ever yeah. done if i'm honest you know and, and it was neat and i really enjoyed it and it was the process of doing it but 
you know, are my academic credentials impressive? Like not in the least. But for me, it's like it was a big deal for me personally to take that step and to to go back and do that. And I was I was proud of the the direction, and because it would have been easy. Like, do I need to do it? I'm like, no, I'm you know I'm business. I'll do okay. I'll try. I'll keep fighting. But I w- I was happy to take the time in between fights when I was when I w- was unbooked for an opponent to do something productive rather than just I'll just hang out. You know, like I can still train every single day, but I can also train and go to school. People go to the Olympics while going to school. I can I can do <laughs> martial arts and, and go to school. One thing I, I gotta ask is, uh, you know, a bunch of women listen to this podcast. If they haven't done jujitsu, I think it'd be kind of intimidating to uh, step on the mat with a bunch of bros uh, that like enjoy somehow killing each other. Like, how do you succeed in that environment to where you can learn this art, learn how to beat all those people up? Um. Oh gosh. Is there any advice? I mean, another way to f- ask that is like, if if uh, any women listening to this are interested in starting jujitsu, like, is there advice for that journey? Honestly, I think it's just walking in the door and starting. Sometimes I don't know how to respond to that because I'm not a. T- I don't view myself as typically anxious, particularly um, uh, in, in, in interactions with other people or new people. It's, Shy, shy is not a word that has been used for me by <laughs> if you ask my family and. Um, they joke because our son talks a lot. He's advanced verbally, and they're always like, "Oh, well, it's, we know where he gets that from." Yeah. Like, because he just doesn't stop talking. He narrates everything he does, um, and so they always tease because that's like I'm known for for kind of talking a lot. Um, but so I haven't been typically. I'm not. I don't consider myself a shy person. So for me, going into um, a new room, a new group of people is. You know, there's there's always that you don't really know who they are, how they're going to treat you. But I tip, but I I don't have a lot of anxiety with that. So I, I don't if that's something that's going to put somebody off. I don't really know how to to address that particular feeling. Um, but in terms of all of the rooms I've been in, I have popped into jiu-jitsu gyms before I knew Ryan in Florida. Like I traveled for my job so in Germany and Florida and in California and places where where I don't know anyone, they don't know me. And I have never once had anyone be anything other than than kind and solicitous and helpful. Um, and long before when I was a white belt and a blue belt and didn't know anything and and didn't know anyone. And um, I just think that it's a community of people that it's so cool that no matter where you go in the world, um, I walked into a gym in Prague one time where only two people spoke English. and And it was just... Yeah, it's weird. You it's know, weird. instantly it's weird you're that, like, like part of a group and they're like, oh, let me tell you what it's like. It's like being part of a cult, eat. right? Yeah. 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 Well, but it's like a positive cult. Like it, it mm-hmm. for sure. That's what we would say as cultists. <laughs> as for, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I mean, we do need to murder every week who practice Aikido. I mean, we, <laughs> yeah. That's this cult uh, tr- deeply <laughs> believes in. No, but there is a, like if you look at different kinds of games like chess and so on, like there's a skepticism I mean, there's not a brotherhood, sisterhood feeling. With jiu-jitsu, it's like you can roll into most places. Even like with judo, like I can see the contrast. Like, cause I've trained in judo places. It, uh, it's more like tribal. Like you walk in and like, who is this? Like there's that kind of feeling. With jiu-jitsu, there's uh, less so. There is a little bit with like the competitors. There's always like, the competitors feeling each other out, usually like the blue belts. <laughs> uh, but like outside of that, in terms of if you don't get the, if you, if you walk in with the vibes of just uh, loving the art and just wanting to have uh, a good time, you're like, welcome. It's, it's really cool. It's, it's really fascinating. It's a really great um, thing, I think. And as a woman, I think you, you think you're walking into these rooms of these, you know, big, strong, tough guys and um, if anything, I would, I would say that they're almost like much more solicitous when a woman comes in there and not like they're just like hitting on you all the time. You know, it's just that you walk in and everyone is like, oh, cool. You want to do this thing that I love. Let me make sure you have a good experience and take care of you. And I think that's, that's an experience that, that I hope people have when they come into our gym. And, and that I've, I've always felt when I walked into other gyms. And, and so, you know, we try our best to, to, to make that comfortable. And, and it can be a little uncomfortable because there are, when you walk into a male dominated environment, there's conversations and topics. There's a different style of camaraderie and joking that a lot of men will do that 
um, maybe some women are more uncomfortable with. I grew up with four brothers, so I kind of maybe was a little more uh, desensitized to that. Um, and I worked for the Department of Defense for for a while too. So before I, 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 I so you're with the government. Full-time. Yeah. So so I did that. So for I'm a while already after skeptical. College. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I so left. I'm not, I'm I not, left. Oh, you left. I'm not going to ask you about UFOs then because you're not going to tell me the truth. No. <laughs> they exist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, you just freaked out a lot of people. Okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, by the way, where's where's your school? Because people always ask like where... Uh... Uh, well, we're outside of Washington, D.C. in Northern Virginia in Falls Church. You always want to pick like what's the best school if I travel to this place or mm-hmm. if I if I want to move to this place. So that's well. I so mean, DC. obviously we're biased, but yeah, yeah well, we're we're in the Washington D.C. area. The best. Okay, we just took a little break. Now we're back. Let me ask you uh, one thing that a bunch of people are curious about. You're one of the innovators. First of all, you're one of the great innovators and philosophers and thinkers in jujitsu, right? Uh, but you're also one of the innovators in terms of leg locks and and the 50-50 position and just like the fact that legs have something to do in jiu-jitsu. Uh, the, the, under, the other popularizer innovator in the space is John Donahue and his whole group of guys. Do you have um, thoughts about their whole system of leg locks and the, their ideas about jiu-jitsu and so on? Sure. I, I guess, uh, you know, obviously, you know, John and, and the students at Henzo have been able to do fantastic things competitively in the past number of years. And, you know, um, you, you mentioned innovators in the in that kind of, you know, section of jiu-jitsu. I, I would be, uh, I'd, I'd love to bring up some guys like Dean Lister, um, yeah. of course, uh, Masakazu Minari. In fact, a lot of what was going on in, in like 90s Japan, like combat submission wrestling, there was some crazy gnarly stuff that it's just, it's on grainy VHS tape, but like stuff that if people were doing now, they go, oh my God, that's brand new. Like there's, um, it's it's been, I think these are things that have been around for a while um, in various places. I first learned the 50-50 position, just like the leg entanglement of it from Brandon Vera, actually at a seminar at Lord Irvin's Martial Arts, I think in 2005. He learned it from Dean Lister, uh, who used it to submit Alexandre Kakareko, a really, really tough nogi guy at ADCC on the, in the run that uh, Dean made to the, to the gold medal in the absolute division, which was a great performance at the time, first American to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, and I actually saw a video. I mean, first a boss Rutten actually broke, I think Guy Mesger's foot with a a 50-50 heel hook that he actually grabbed his heel and his and his toes and went like <laughs> and in pank races back when they had like the man panties and the high uh yeah. high boots on yeah and uh dude that was gnarly boss rooting is underappreciated as like as like a, he double oh grab, yeah like and just oh yeah twist. like you yeah. know his leverage is leverage it's that's, that's like a toehold that's you know that goes the other way and it's like it either doesn't work or breaks in half and uh well he's it, uh is uh, people don't often think of boss rooting as an innovator but he is in a way like he, uh, you know, talk about like Elon Musk and first principles thinking in terms of physics. Mm-hmm. He like just feels like he just gets the job. He figures out like the simplest way to get the job oh, yeah. done of breaking things and establishing control and hurting people. Remember that was back in the boss. If you listen to Boss Root and do any like commentary for any of the uh, the big MMA shows or any MMA show way back when, anytime guys were clinching, he's like, the guy should roll for a knee bar. He was saying that way back when, and yeah. now people are doing it all the time with varying degrees of success. It's it's funny. It's like, it's also tough to be, uh, I think like a breakaway thinker. I mean, you know, group think is a real thing and, and group inertia. And it's, it's neat to see, um, you know, particularly at, at a time when maybe that type of stuff was less accepted, um, you know, someone going, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to run off in this other direction. I think, you know, whoever, you know, the inventor of electricity in my mind is a lot more impressive than whomever, not to say that the person down the line isn't impressive that comes up with an interesting way to use it. Mm -hmm. Um, both are cool, but when you think about just, can you imagine we're sitting here we're like, yeah, people, I'm going to build an airplane. You're like, what are you talking about? It's crazy. People don't fly. I'm like, no, I'm going to do it. And of course it's not going to be as good as the airplane down the line, the iterative things that happen later on. But, um, just being able to go to dream something into existence that you haven't seen before and then make it happen, like takes an unbelievable, like strength of character, almost like a force of will, because you have, you're, you're, you're blazing a trail that hasn't been walked before. That's the BJ Penn factor in, you know, winning the Jiu Jitsu world championship, first non-Brazilian to do that. That was back in 2001. And then Rafael Lovato later on, it's like, he's, you know, both of those guys are so unbelievably impressive in my mind for the same reason, you know, because they were, 
out there winning at a time when that wasn't a common thing. Not that it's easy to win now. It's just, there's not a psychological hurdle that needs to be leapt. I remember, you know, when I was early in jiu-jitsu, like Americans weren't winning the world championships at any belt. I mean, BJ, we all knew BJ Penn because BJ Penn did it, but it was really, really uncommon. Now it happens, you know, on a semi-regular basis. Of course, the Brazilians are still strong. Europeans are still strong. But uh, and Australians are coming on as well. But uh, it's it's definitely kind of an interesting thing. So to come back to you know John Danaher and the uh, Henzo team, obviously they're doing fantastic things. John's had some really really great innovation there, and the the the, the systematization and the methodology that they're using is uh, is great, and it's neat to see that it's getting out there. Um, I would just also. What I would encourage people to make sure that they're, you know, catching up on their history because obviously, you know, John's a brilliant instructor and has, has done things, you know, for the sport that um, that are fantastic that haven't been done before. But you know, none of us exist in a vacuum, and I've learned things from everywhere else. So you know, John would say the same, I'm sure, and uh, you know, Dean Lister would say the same. And it, it's just neat when you can kind of trace the history of all of this happening because we've had humanity's had two arms and two legs for some time, at least as long as I've been alive. But you mentioned and, like. Airplanes. Do you think there's something totally new to be invented in jujitsu still? Not totally new, but like the, you know, flying isn't new, right. uh, but airplanes nevertheless made that much more efficient. Is there like new ideas would, to be discovered in jujitsu still? I'd say the reason I'd say yes is the same reason I would say I believe in alchemy, even though I <laughs> don't. No, I'm serious. I, like yeah, I've got right. some, some backing for this. Okay. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I talk about this with a buddy of mine a lot, like, uh, and it, facilitative versus not facilitative beliefs. And if I don't believe something is possible and I do no investigation towards it, I'll never find something, even if it's there. It's almost like, it's no different than me walking up on a group of people and going like, oh man, look at these jerks, this is gonna suck, versus me going, oh, I wonder what these guys are up to. I'm about to have two very different conversations, even though the players in the game are no different. My internal constitution has changed because of, of how I've decided to approach the situation. So although I wouldn't personally wanna spend all my time trying to turn lead into gold because I don't believe that it's likely to work, only a, a person who's willing to spend his or her life in that pursuit will actually get to the bottom of that. And also in the in the pursuit of that, they're likely to find other things. So I think a lot of times the idea is that humanity is pushed forward by, you know, again, it's another Orson Scott Carb one. It's like, you know, human beings are in this slog. It's I'm paraphrasing just in this slog over time. And then periodically humanity gives birth to genius, like someone that invents the wheel, invents electricity, pushes us forward, you know, comes up with, with the idea of governance that doesn't, you know, just start and end with the point of a sword, you know? And, uh, you know, these aren't common things. These are unbelievable advancements that, you know, that I, not just me sitting here, I didn't come up with them, but I just get the benefit of it. So I guess what I would say is a lot of times these ideas are called crazy, you know, like as we discussed on kind of offline, it's like, you know, Einstein was brilliant in his 20s and it was brilliant before that, I would suspect, but basically, uh, you know, gets recognized later on in life. And oh, of course, we all thought those were great ideas. The man was probably roundly mocked for giant chunks of his life. Yeah. And I, I guess so it's neat to, I would say there's definitely in my mind things that even if it's just combinations and new to me new ways to see things new ways to understand different depth of understanding possibly new things new positions new ideas because even if that's not true the process of, of going through and acting as if it is and believing like that and focusing and and trying to investigate will make any of us will push us all forward whereas sitting there you know obsessing over the cult of our current knowledge i think is the biggest the biggest danger um, and the biggest cause of stagnation that exists anywhere. Yeah, and it starts with believing the the impossible, which is kind of interesting. One of the things that's really inspiring to me is to see people out there, which which sadly are rare, who kind of have uh, a combination of two things. One is they have a worldview that involves, that includes a lot of ideas that are crazy and the second part is they're exceptionally focused and competent in bringing that, whatever the ideas in that worldview to reality. So there's certainly a lot of people with crazy ideas. You know, there's a lot of conspiracy theorists. They have way out their beliefs about things, but they're not doing much to like make the, like build stuff grounded in them. Like they're not engineers or whatever. They're just like espousing different crazy ideas, but that's why you get like the Elon Musk type characters. And the reason I bring him up a lot is cause like, there's not many others to bring up. It's like, there's not many examples of it th through history. The people, I mean, the guy's convinced that we're going to colonize Mars. And basically, 
everybody on earth thinks that's insane. <laughs> Everyone except the guy that's gonna do it, right? <laughs> except that's gonna do it. And like, you can imagine like a couple hundred years from now, people will, I mean, first of all, they they won't, certainly won't remember the haters. <laughs> they won't remember all the people. If, if they do remember them, they'll remember them in a sense like people were silly to think that this isn't the obvious path forward. Like from a perspective, that's what, that's what Elon, talks about like it's obvious that we're going to expand throughout the universe like so from his perspective from his perspective right. like but to me it is also obvious because like either we destroy ourselves or or we'll expand beyond earth like uh like th there's not many you know we well it's not maybe it's not completely obvious i'm i guess i share that world view there's the other possibility that we humans find a sort of of an inner peace where the forces of capitalism will calm down and we'll all just meditate and do yoga and jujitsu and like relax with this whole tech thing mm -hmm. where we keep building new technologies. But it's cool to have those kinds of people that just believe the big, ambitious, crazy dreams. Cause that's where it starts. If you want to build something special, you have to first believe that. When you also have to believe strongly enough that you're not vulnerable and I'm, I'm speculating, but it's like, I can only imagine how many people have told Elon that what he's doing is crazy. So not only did he dream it up, he dreamed it up, went with it, and also went with it in the face of being told that it's not going to work. And then any time, and then also stepped away from the bitterness because he's done a series of really crazy, impressive things. Um, and that's only those little things that I'm aware of. But and also staying away from the bitterness of every single time you did something good. Initially, I all I do is talk down about you, and then eventually I act as of, of course, of course. I, I never apologize. Yeah. And yet you don't let that dampen your spirits for the next innovation, which is pretty incredible yeah. to me to watch. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I mean, uh, it's contagious to spend time with the guy because he's not. It's, it's, Rogan has the same look to him, which is interesting about these people. Is uh, like. There, there's like a hater shield <laughs> that he's like, he doesn't even like sense them. It feels like, like it, it doesn't, he does he thinks to, uh, to Elon, it's like, it's obvious. I mean, he keeps calling it like first principles thinking, like physics says it's true. Therefore it's true. Like he has convinced himself that like his beliefs are grounded in the fundamental fabric of the way the universe works. Therefore the haters don't matter. Right. And I mean, that's kind of like a system of thought. He developed himself through all the difficulty, through all the doubt. He's able to take huge risks with basically putting everything he owes on the line multiple times throughout his life amidst all the drama, amidst all the doubts, amidst all like the, is, he's still able to make just clear, clear headed decisions. It's, I, I don't know what to make of it, but it's inspiring as hell. Well, it, it's, I think it's something that's funny. I think like, I can only imagine the, you know, history will look back on him as a brilliant person, but that's not the only, there's, there's a lot of, maybe not numeric, not statistically speaking, but a lot numerically on a giant planet of, you know, billions of people, a lot of brilliant people. Well, um, you know, time, place, luck, fortune, all that other stuff. But at the same time, that clearly isn't the only determining thing in making Elon Musk, Elon Musk. And obviously I don't know the guy from Adam and, but it's an interesting thing that it's not just his intellect, his belief system, his structure, how he's viewing the world. Like that's, uh, did he did he reason his way to that? Did he not? What other factors came in? I'm I'm really curious about that because I guess coming, it, it's again I, I feel really strongly about people's belief structure and and this the how they view the world being more important than the engine behind it. You know, it, it makes someone resilient or not. It makes someone positive or not because you could have ten thousand. I think about this for competitive stuff. You could have ten thousand things going properly and one thing going improperly. If you focus on the improper, you'll probably fix it at a certain point, which is good, facilitative for development in the long term. But if you had to go and try to perform a task in the next five minutes and you're focusing on the negative, your confidence and your 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 belief in in the positive outcome of the future is likely to be damaged. Whereas you could have 25 things going wrong, but you go, man, I sure am happy to be alive. How fortunate I am. This is great. I can't, this is, I have problems to solve. This is awesome. Versus I ha list the problems and I start bitching about them. Both of them are technically accurate, but it's, I guess, different lenses. And I think that's a really neat thing to see, you know, someone, you know, exemplifying that for us. So maybe to look at the the fighting world, there's a million questions I can ask here. Like one, you mentioned BJ Penn. You uh, first of all, you are undefeated in the UFC, and one of the fights 
you've had is against BJ Penn, which is a uh, kind of an incredible fight. You you won performance of the night. W- what did it feel like to uh, to face BJ Penn and to beat him definitively as you did? Like, what's that whole experience like? I'll be honest. I didn't know if I was going to ever be able to to fight again after beating Gray Maynard in 2016. Um, you know, I've had a couple <laughs> periods of those. I I was about to join the army actually in. Uh, when I was 30, before the uh, before the UFC, before Jen sent me over to Ultimate Fighter, I didn't want to go because I was like, one, they're never going to pick me. Two, I'd be terrible for TV. Three, I'll probably say something. I'm going to get you know burned to death in the streets. You know, I'm like, this isn't a great idea. <laughs> and then uh, she said, well, go out there, see what happens, do it anyway. You'll be you'll regret it if you didn't. And then I ended up doing Ultimate Fighter, and then so I fought three times on the show, and then I fought. Um, for the for the finale, so that's four times in, in like f- five or six months, which was great. And then it took me a year to get a, another opponent. Um, and that was Gray Maynard. And then Gray was obviously a very tough guy. Um, managed to get a good outcome there. Then it took two years to to fight BJ Penn. And that was you know obviously I'm training all the time every single day, and that, that never stops. But that was I'll be honest, like pretty deeply frustrating because you know as a, as a human being, as an athlete, you know I think as an athlete you die twice. Like you have an athletic peak or area and then then you go on with the rest of your life but it is a microcosm for the rest of your life it's like you're you're seeing this the sand tick away in the hourglass or drop away and you're going man this is these are the years between 31 32 33 like i'll be at my best at this time my absolute best physically now not technically i'm a lot better now than i was before and i plan but at a certain point you will unless you're bernard hopkins you will reach diminishing returns and I guess that, the long the long wait you can feel the clock ticking is it's yeah. frustrating. So why why did it take two years for BJ? I uh, I I Th- that's the question people ask a lot. It's like why does nobody want to fight Ryan? I don't know. I probably they probably think they'll get infected by whatever this is. But yeah. uh, I don't I don't I don't blame them. But uh, I would. I mean, you're a really me. tough opponent. Is bo- is the different. bottom line? I'll say that I'm different. I, maybe they perceive that the uh, the 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 threat is greater than the reward i'm hoping that now that we're ranked number 12 you know in the ufc rankings that uh that that will change and i know that if we're one more win and then we're in the top 10 that you know now now we're you're there but uh what i've consistently found is that like randoms want to fight and i'm like go away you know, I, I didn't come here for you you know because if i wanted to just fight anybody i could go down to a waffle house and yell until like dmx shows up and we can we can yeah. fight because he'll be at the waffle house too who am i kidding i really want to hang out with dmx but uh you know it's like you want to when i had the opportunity Ryan Hall and dmx oh at my waffle god that'd be so cool I would, I would like never netflix show or i would something. never fight dmx we'd be on the same team no <laughs> but uh anyway um it's i i guess um I, I accepted fights against. Uh, I, I asked. I got asked about Lamas. I said yes. I got asked about Dennis Bermudez. I said yes. Um, you know, like long periods of time, and they uh, at that time, well, you know, in between 2016 and 2018, um, I, I was struggling to have have opponents who would sign up, and uh, so I haven't turned down fights. I've just said, hey, you know, keep the. I don't care about fighting the randoms, and it's. Just, I mean, you have a successful school. You're like. You're running. You're a martial artist, broadly speaking. So it doesn't make sense to to take fights that aren't like right that fit a, a certain kind of trajectory for your career. And that's when when BJ Penn they said, well, BJ's looking for an opponent. I was like, I'm I'm your guy. And uh, and I think that you know BJ accepted that fight because I'm a, another jujitsu guy. I don't think he he, per, he perceived that I was much of a threat on the feet. Yeah. Um and. Uh, you know, I was able to, it was neat to get it to compete against someone, uh, you know, who's one of my heroes, one of the people I looked up to in MMA for the longest time. Were and you intimidated by that? No, no, I, I love competing. I, I don't really get nervous or scared before fights. I'm not afraid to get hurt. I'm not afraid to win. I'm not afraid to lose. It's, I, I'm just excited for the, I feel thankful for the opportunity to compete and the opportunity to, to play when it matters. You know, I, I just, but that's the only time I'm interested in playing anymore is when it when it matters when the opposition is I know that you know p- it's funny because people pick on on a lot of m- some opponents particularly after after the fact like if you if you get a good outcome well then oh, of course Lex beat that guy that guy wasn't that good I'm like well I was <laughs> that's after the fact I get to say that and also as the person in the ring you know BJ Penn has hurt a lot of people in 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 mixed martial arts cage and I could actually absolutely have been on that list. Um, so it was neat to get to compete against someone that I really respect, someone that I looked up to for a long time, someone who has a great skill set. And also I went up in weight to fight him at his weight class. He didn't have to come down to mine, which is where he'd take lightweight. It was lightweight. Yeah. Um, I generally a featherweight. I walk around at like 158 pounds. So, um, what's uh, what's lightweight and featherweight? Uh, lightweight is 155. 
with a day before weigh-in and featherweight is 145 with a day before weigh-in. So I'm a little bit more properly sized for featherweight. But um, anyway, uh, you know, I so I didn't feel like, obviously he was giving up a couple years of age, but I was giving up size and all this other stuff. And it was, you know, I was just excited to have the opportunity to step in against someone like BJ. And, uh, you know, we managed to, to get out of there with a, with a good outcome without getting too banged up. But uh, just, it was cool because we tied up on the fence and just even uh, the second, you know, is when you're rolling with somebody and you touch and you can feel what they're doing. You go, oh man, this guy's really good. Um, you can feel the calm. You can feel the small minor adjustments that they're making, the subtle things that they're doing. And uh, that was one of those things that was really neat and gratifying because, you know, you, you never know. Sometimes people that you've heard of are a little bit less technically proficient than you thought. And other times you'll meet some guy that you train like, who the hell is this guy? How have I not heard of this person? And uh, BJ was exactly as a jiu-jitsu guy what I would have thought. And uh, another thing, that's another thing that bugged me about how people reacted after the fight is, uh, you know, it basically going, oh, BJ screwed up this, screwed up that. And I'm like, all right, yeah. That's tell so interesting. That's sad. I, I, that was, you know, one of the, I, I, to me, I mean, as a fan of both, that was a beautiful moment is, uh, as, a, as a kind of passing of a torch in a sense of a, an exceptional performance. Like another one that stands out to me, maybe you can comment is, I don't understand, well, maybe I do, why Conor McGregor gets as much hate as he does. Uh, he probably revels in it, but I think he doesn't get enough credit for uh, uh, Jose Aldo, for the, for like, for basically, you know, knocking him out in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the first few uh, seconds of, uh, of a fight. I mean, uh, Jose is like one of the greatest fighters ever. That's true. Uh, maybe some people can be even put him in the top 10. No question. And the, like, I don't understand why it's, doesn't get as much, like Conor McGregor doesn't get as much credit uh, as I think he deserves for that and for Eddie Alvarez and all the fights. For some reason, whenever uh, Conor McGregor beats somebody, well, that they they were not that good then. Like, it means like they were, they, they were, there's something was off. Right, that's and, convenient, isn't it? Yeah, it's, 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 it's quite strange to me. But I mean, what are your thoughts on the, um, on Conor McGregor, maybe one way to ask that. I'm Russian, so I'm obviously also a Khabib fan, mm -hmm. but I'm also a Conor fan. It seems like there's not many of us who are like fans of both. Right. Um, what are your thoughts? You and Artem Lobov. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> the two of us, which also is a good fight. Uh, uh, tough dude. Yeah, t really, really tough dude. Uh, Speaks like five languages, really interesting cat. Also, oh, the, oh wow, I didn't okay. know that side of it. So he's, there's a brain there. Yep. Well, on the Khabib versus Conor, what do you make of their first fight? What do you do? You agree with me that uh, they should fight again? Because I think it would be awesome if they fought again in, mm -hmm. in Moscow. And uh, do you agree with me? I'm just going to put say things that piss people off, but I believe is that Connor actually has a chance to beat Khabib. One, that Connor absolutely has a chance to beat Khabib. Connor has a chance to beat anyone that he steps into that ring with, and not just like a mathematical chance. You're like, oh, one of the billion, but yeah. like you know, like he. Absolutely. Uh, it's funny because I, I won't pretend to know Connor really well, but I first met Connor in 2010 when I was teaching a seminar in uh, at Straight Blessed Gym Ireland in Dublin. Um, and that's actually where I first met all of the coaches that ended up being on Connor's team. Um, you know, John Kavanaugh, Owen Roddy, uh, Gunnar Nelson. You know, so for I actually I enjoyed being on Ultimate Fighter and being on uh, Uriah Favors team and, and getting to train with all the guys there. But at the same time, the, the people that I was actually, I knew better were actually the European side, all, all of Connor's coaches. Um, and uh, that was a neat thing because I got to, I met Connor. I didn't know who Connor, like Connor wasn't Connor at that point. Yeah, that was before his UFC debut. Oh yeah, well well before, yeah. yeah. I think I think he got in like 2014, maybe something like that. Yeah, and uh, anyway, but he was doing well in Cage Warriors, winning the titles there, I think prior to that. You know, I, I remember going, seeing him on the show and uh, also then getting to see him train because I, I competed, uh, I was initially slated to fight David Tamer for the Ultimate Fighter finale before getting put in to fight Artem uh, for the uh, title for the show. So I went over to Ireland to train for a couple of days and basically it was neat to watch him, watch him work. I mean, man is focused and trains a lot and is very, very smart and very, very hardworking. And I think a lot of times people get stuck in the, uh, in this, um, you know, and they, almost want to believe that this was lucky or that this this person you know like they're not working that hard they're just out there they got there with their mouth 
And that's, that's just not the case. And, um, you know, I don't know what it's like, you know, obviously Connor's very well off right now and I don't know how hard, how serious he's training, what he's doing. I can't speak to any of that, but, uh, there's no question that, that he has skills to be dangerous. And one of the funny things, obviously the Khabib fight went Khabib's way. Khabib was a great fighter and, and also has the chance to beat anyone in that ring at any given time. But, uh, there's, there was an Connor, you know, it's, uh, one the he can, he can put anybody away. And as you mentioned, I think that he doesn't get the credit for the Eddie Alvarez fight. He doesn't get the credit for the Jose Aldo fight because it was almost so much of a letdown. I remember that happened the same weekend that I did the Ultimate Fighter finale. And you're like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It almost doesn't feel like a fight happened. Yeah. But we mentioned Miyamoto Musashi. I mean, Musashi was famous for the way he poked and prodded at people with what he was doing, whether overtly or not. It's like, oh, we're supposed to fight to the death in, uh, you know, at 3 p.m. tomorrow. Great. <sighs> 4 p.m. rolls around. I'm just not there. Five. I mean, you remember all the all the antics and nonsense that Connor was pulling prior to that. Like speaking personally, that's not I, it's not something I would feel comfortable doing. But it's like everyone's different, and the effect that it had on on Jose was, I mean, beyond evident. When was the last time Jose started the started the fight with leaping left hand, leaping yeah. right hand? You're like, wait, what? <laughs> and then he was obviously, you know, living rent free in, in Jose's head at that point. And that was a combination of psychological, you know, ability and, and, and wherewithal and then physical. And it reminded me of the way Muhammad Ali would, would bother people and whatnot. And, uh, the fact that he's a polarizing figure, um, I, I think makes some people not give him his due. And then at the same time, sometimes certain fans maybe go overboard, but, uh, they remember the knee that, Ben Askren got knocked out with by Masvidal. I mean, that was an amazing, unbelievable thing, but three inches to the right or three inches to the left, I guess whichever side his head wasn't, now you have, could have been square yeah. But uh, And that fight starts with Ben Askren on top of you in the first five seconds. Yeah. Well, Connor ran and threw a knee just like that at Khabib, and Khabib got right around it. That could have easily gone the other way. Can you imagine what would have happened if after the, after coming back from boxing, um, after coming back from from the Mayweather fight, Connor, Connor rocks Khabib in the first ten seconds. It's over, and you're like, he would, it, 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 it would have been intolerable. Yeah. But basically, yeah, that would, like you know. No, but see, here's the thing. Let me actually push back slightly. Uh, I mean, to, no, to, please, the fan, to the fans, correct me if I'm wrong, but Connor seems to because I've competed a lot, and mm -hmm. like there's a tension, there's a negativity sometimes depending on the opponent, and there's a respect afterwards that happens. Like when you understand that there's a deep like respect and almost like love for each other. Mm -hmm. Like I always seen that in Connor, like all the trash talk afterwards. Yes. There's a, it's it's a subtle thing. You, you can't always see it, but yep. there's a respect. Like- I agree. And the, like that I almost on the Khabib side, I almost feel like Khabib, really took it personally he did he didn't he lost the respect for connor i thought i thought the yeah. whole time connor had the respect so i, I what i want to say is like if connor won that fight like rock khabib i could see like i wouldn't see trash talking i, I could see like trash talking stop right there I, I think so too but at the same time i'm, I'm sure you recall like connor connor crossed in some pretty personal territory yeah, he, he you know both religiously and and also familiarly with uh with khabib and it's you know i mean i think it's the sort of thing that I don't know. It's it's an interesting. That's well, one of the it reasons. Depends. Like you have to know the difference. So, so yeah. I, obviously, I know the 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 Khabib, uh, the Dagestani people. They don't play around like that. They don't play around like that. You, yeah. don't, you don't. I mean, they take offense to basically. And you, I mean, you you don't do that. So, right. uh, so like Connor didn't. Maybe he did on purpose, or maybe he wasn't even just aware of totally of uh, <laughs> it was cultural differences. Of, of you the know? box he opened, yeah. like you, you can talk to if, uh, Floyd Mayweather. You can you can go anywhere with him. You can you can say the most offensive things, but with uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> could be hard lines. It's a, it's yeah hard lines. But you, uh, I mean, a lot of people ask. I know you're a featherweight, but if you were to uh, face it feels like Khabib was one of the hardest puzzles to solve yep. in, in all of mixed martial arts. Yes. If you were to face Khabib, do you think, how would you go about solving that puzzle? Like almost, the question is almost from a jujitsu perspective too. What do you do with a guy that's exceptionally good at controlling position, especially on top, very good at wrestling and taking down and controlling position? Like, let's say, so forget maybe striking, on the ground, how do you solve that guy? Like, what do you do with your guard? 
if you get taken down or do you create an entire system of not getting taken down or escaping? It's like, what, what ideas do you have for that? Well, I guess I would say in my mind, fighting is a game of trading energy. Um, kind of, uh, you know, there's two, there's two things. There's damage and there's energy. So like when I say energy, I mean like uh, tired, not tired, how much, how much gas you've got. Um, and then damage counts obviously as well. Um, you could be feeling, I could be feeling great. And then you get to kick me in the head hard, really hard three times. It doesn't matter that I could get up and run a mile. I can't get up. So anyway, um, you know, I, th I think what Khabib does is so well is he makes the fight look like it could be a Magomedov fight. Um, he does a great job of avoiding damage on the feet for the most part and really sucking the life out of people with how suffocating and oppressive is his control is. Um, his chain wrestling is as good as anyone we've ever seen in the UFC. It's fantastic. Um, but uh, it, that poses a really serious threat for people that need to maintain a certain amount of space and try to hurt him on the feet because unless they're able to inflict an adequate amount of damage, th they're gonna, each time, let's say for instance, let's say him taking them down as a foregone conclusion at some point. Um, if every single time Khabib takes you down, you get right back up, it's not that big a deal. Um, because it's actually more, we've all experienced this. Let's say you and I are rolling, you tap me 15 times in one round. Who's more tired? Probably you are. <laughs> yeah. You whoop my ass so badly that, that it's like, you're the only one working. But- um, So if you're comfortable, with you, the up and down of it, like being taken down. If you're, if you don't, if, if you don't get hurt badly or tired on the bottom, you have a chance, but that doesn't involve just cracking him on the feet before he gets a hold of you. Uh, that's a lot. That's I mean, a lot that, to ask. That's, that's a lot to ask. That's difficult to do. It seemed actually like Connor, it seemed like it when he was being kind of taken down or the, the takedown attempts against Khabib. He seemed to be somewhat relaxed through the whole thing. I thought he was doing well, actually. I think that particularly for the first round, I thought he did a, a very good job. It's just one of those things that I think like uh, Khabib being, K K the fights taking place in Khabib's world in large part. And I mean, set aside that one giant, uh, what is it, right hand that that Khabib hit Connor with. That, by the way, Connor reacted like an absolute champion. He got crushed by that overhand and then drop and his eyes went right back on Khabib. It was immediate, positive, great response. So even though that was, I think, that was a bit of a surprising thing. Connor reacted really, really well. But if you're going to be on bottom with Khabib for four rounds, that's going to be tough. And also, Connor's a way better grappler than people like to give him credit for. But he's not the type of grappler that can do that can that can that's too tall of an order. But th there are grapplers that could do that, or at least would have a much much better shot at uh, being able to weather that type of a storm. Do it, you see yourself being able to be relaxed through that kind of storm? Yes. <laughs> well, I guess. I <laughs> Remember, being no, punched, no, being, being being savagely beaten is very relaxing. The, the, the time, the, the timing of that answer was like, okay, <laughs> that's a dumb question. No, that's ultimately the goal of jujitsu is to um, be relaxed to the fire right? for sure. And remember, like every UFC fighter, I win all hypothetical matchups. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Uh, since uh, I'm one to ask ridiculous questions, and we've been talking about sci-fi and all that kind of stuff. Let me ask the kind of big question that everybody disagrees about, certainly with me, is uh, who are the top five greatest MMA fighters of all time? Oh man. And um, um, why is Fedor number one? Okay, well, first off, Fedor is number one. Oh, really? Oh, you yeah, agree with, right oh, there with you. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay, dude, dude, talk about people that just get completely underappreciated. Even though he's never been in the, uh, like he's never succeeded in the UFC? It's not his fault it came along after him. Yeah. At the time that at the time that Fedor was at his height, the UFC was not where it was at for heavyweight fighting. I mean, not that there weren't good heavyweights there, but Fedor, Fedor was unbelievable. You know, I mean, you remember, I mean, and Minotaro Noguera, I was a massive fan of him. I still remember watching, uh, what is it, Pride 2004 when when Noguera fought Krokop and got blasted with that left kick and dropped with like seconds left in the first round. Pride was great because that had a 10-minute first round and that five-minute second, which again, materially alters, alters the fight big time. And, you know, just the texture of the fight. Cause it's totally, it's borderline a different sport, you know, than, than getting a five, a pause and a five. Yeah. But anyway, uh, similar sports, like one of those swimming things where they have nine gold medals for different types of swimming, right? right. <laughs> but still swimming, but anyway, uh, um, <laughs> Oh well, yeah, they would disagree. My mom yeah, I don't they mean I'm not trying to. In the, of but course. it's so it's totally true. Ten ten minutes is different than five yeah, minutes. Sorry, I'll, uh, I'll take, I take, <laughs> don't 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 drown me, swimmers. I don't swim very well. It's easy for me to, <laughs> easy for me to, to to downplay it. But anyway, um, 
Uh, yeah, and then no, so I mean, better than uh, John Jones, like the modern era. Well, I mean, I guess it's it's tough to compare to compare across eras. It, it it would be like going and saying like, oh man, how how would such and such great grappler from today fare against someone from 1995? I'm like, well, probably pretty well for them, depending upon who they are, what's going on. You know, there's some people that would their skill sets might transition across eras, but a lot of times not. But that's not fair. We get the, they'll be like comparing yeah. Spartans to modern day, you know, like army guys. You're like, well, who's going to win? I'm like, well, did modern day army guys get modern day weapons? Well, yeah, but who's the toughest, ruggedest group of people at the very least? So I guess it's it's tough to say, but at least in my mind, the people that I think about for great fighters, their their, their quality of opposition. Um, their level of like lasting and like success, their level of lasting innovation, like the courage that they have to demonstrate. Because again, it's like being a big fish in a small pond takes no courage. Doesn't mean that there's nothing there, but it, it just requires something a little bit different. So Kazushi Sakuraba is one of my guys too. Nice. Um, BJ Penn also, I mean, BJ Penn fought Lyoto Machida. Yeah. That's insane. You know, it's, that was a time, it was a different sport. It was a different time in the sport where, you know, they were, some guys were, were bouncing around doing different things, but let's. So I, I guess the, the Gracie family, it's, I mean, uh, they never had an, 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 like obviously Hoist was there, um, but they never, and that was a, definitely a different sport. Weight classes being open, things like that. Yeah, but you have to say that Hoist is up there. Oh, no it's question. One, one of the greatest ever. I, I think so too. And and again, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you um, if it weren't for him. So the, the Gracie family as a whole, but I mean, who's the better, f I mean, I think hoist would tell you himself probably that, that hickson would have handled business back then yeah. but they didn't put him in so again he's the greatest fighter the greatest fighter the greatest fighter that we saw do his business so hoist up there for sure what about so this is like nobody seems to agree with me on this but like this connects to soccer again and Messi. it seems that people value like how long you've been a champion how many like defenses of the championship that you've mm -hmm. had successfully to me, I highly value singular moments of genius. So like, like I, I don't, like if you look at Conor McGregor, he hasn't, I guess, held, been a champion very long, very much. Well, he didn't defend either title, right? He didn't defend any other, yeah. t uh, either of the titles. But like, if you, and same with Messi, if you look at uh, Lionel Messi, there's just moments of brilliance, unlike any other in history for both Conor and Messi. And people don't seem to give credits. Like, well, how many World Cups have you won? But to me, like, why is it about this arbitrary World Cup thing or championship thing? I think it's easier for people to wrap their head around, right? It's like yeah. the NFL Combine. When was, I mean, numbers. Tom, yeah, numbers. It's something, we, well, again, if I go and I, if I pick Tom Brady in the first round, you know, and it works out, they call me a genius. If I pick Tom Brady in the first round after his Combine and it doesn't work out, I get fired and I'm never hired again. I have to work work somewhere else but it's like i'm insulating myself from criticism i think almost if i go by the numbers well he had more bench presses it's like how <laughs> how many times have the guys that are like the super studs in the uh in, in the nfl combine ever been on the greatest players in the nfl history in nfl history like zero or close to zero and even if it, even if there's some it's certainly not a one-to-one -one correlation so it's so funny though i think it's just like how many how long how many days did he hold the title oh your title reign was x times longer that means nothing. So if we wanted to find greatest fighter ever, like you said, I think individual moments of like, you're like, that was transcendent. That was different. That was something else. Because people can win or lose for any number of different reasons. And that that's an interesting thing. Again, I don't blame Argentina not winning the World Cup on Messi. You know, it, that's not fair. You know, how many times has, you know, I mean, I, I'll use the, I remember when uh, Trent Dilfer was the quarterback for the uh, the Baltimore Ravens and they had such a strong defense. I'm not trying to pick on Trent Dilfer, but it's like they they had such a strong defense that that they were able to make it. That was the Ray Lewis, you know, Chris McAllister era, you know, and they, they, won, they won the Super Bowl. I don't think anyone is going to say that, you know, Trent Dilfer is a better quarterback than, you know, or put him in the same category as Dan Marino, but he got the W. He's got the he's got the Super Bowl ring. How many times? Uh, let's use March Madness or Super Bowl. I love it. Like that that guy always makes the finals, but he just never gets it done. Yeah. So let me get this straight. Getting <laughs> to the finals nine times doesn't count because you didn't win the end game. I'm not saying it wouldn't be better, yeah. but that guy won the game once. He got over the hump. Well, how many other times was he in the finals? Zero. You're like, all right. Yeah. It's interesting. What we yeah that we were obsessed with these numbers like. um because we yeah. can't assess their method, right? Yeah. Well, I think most of the time, most of us can't assess the method of anything. I mean, it's like, oh, look at that guy do X, Y swimming. I'm like, how do I know Michael Phelps is great? I don't know. He was faster. I can't look at his technique and, and say anything other than 
well, that's way better than anything I know how to do, but I can't say the difference between him and the next guy. So I guess that's, I, I wonder if it's like, I need a concrete identifier. And, and a lot of times people don't like saying, I don't know. And most people won't put like a Ronda Rousey in the top even 20 or 50 of, but like she changed more than, more than almost anybody else. She changed the martial arts history. I, I don't know if that even, I, I don't think I'm over exaggerating that. She, she made it okay for women to be fighters. Yeah. And it, and like changed the way we see, like she's one of the great feminists of our time. <laughs> <laughs> like, in, her own, I don't know. in her own way yeah in in a, in a weird kind of way that like i don't know uh maybe i'm just a ronda rousey fan but the yeah the but she's not in the conversation because then you start converting into numbers well how many did well, she, actually was she is she among the greatest fighters or did she do the greatest things you know what yeah. i mean i don't yeah, it's i think hard. It, it's something not, i mean obviously ronda is a great judoka who was competing in mma at a time when a lot of the girls like where did you get your skills in the olympics oh where'd you get yours high school you're like yeah you're gonna olympic <laughs> yeah. girls gonna beat you up but uh I, I guess that that doesn't diminish her. It just it, that accomplishment is what it is. I don't have to, I don't, Fedor is not diminished by the fact that he would, like, if he were to fight Stephen Miocic right now, it probably wouldn't go great. Or that John Jones exists. I don't now have to, like, knock Fedor's accomplishments down or say, oh, because BJ Penn or so and so, let's say, has a mixed record at this point that somehow invalidates the things that they've done before. I guess it kind of brings us back to a lot of the other people we've talked about. The fact that the the brilliant people throughout history that we love or some of the monsters throughout history that we rightly revile in a lot of cases were complicated people and their legacy is more than just one thing. And someone doing something amazing doesn't inval doesn't mean they didn't do anything bad. And someone doing terrible things doesn't doesn't mean that doesn't invalidate the the positives that they did. But I guess we we're fighting the urge to put people in one category. And same with ourselves. I think that's why people get depressed. Oh, I'm good right now. Oh, I'm bad right now versus, hey, we're all a work in progress and we're trying to do X number of things and legacy is a tough thing to figure out anyway. And it's all speculative. Last time or no, on Reddit, you said that last time too, that you don't experience much fear uh, before fights. I'd, I'd like to ask you a couple of Mike Tyson things if it's okay. It's just interesting to me. Maybe yeah. I'm just weird. So there's a, I don't know if you've seen this clip of uh, Tyson talking about how he feels leading up to a fight that uh, he's kind of overtaken with fear mm -hmm. as he gets closer and closer and closer to the ring, his uh, confidence grows. Uh, that, have you seen the clip? Uh, I'm, I'm aware of it, but okay. I haven't seen it in a while. Here, let me play it for you. I think George St. Pierre said something similar to me one time. While I'm in the dressing room, five minutes before I come out, my gloves are laced up. I'm breaking my gloves down. I'm pushing the lever at the back of my I'm gloves. breaking the middle of the gloves so my knuckle can pierce through the lever. I feel my knuckle piercing against the tight leather gloves on the Everlast boxing glove. When I come out, I have supreme confidence, but I'm scared to death. I'm totally afraid. I'm afraid of everything. I'm afraid of losing. I'm afraid of being humiliated, but I'm totally confident. The closer I get to the ring, the more confidence I get. The closer, the more confidence I get. The closer, the more confidence I get. All during my training, I've afraid of this man. I thought this man might be capable of beating me. I've dreamed of him beating me, but, that was, but I always stayed afraid of him. But as close as I get to the ring, I'm more confident. Once I'm in the ring, I'm a god. No one could beat me. I'm a god. I mean, first of all, he's cognizant of both his demons and whatever the hell ideas he has about violence is so interesting. Is there something about the, uh, the tension that he's describing about being confident and scared that resonates with you? Or you, <laughs> or do you hold to this idea that you've kind of spoken about before that you're really not afraid? No, I, I can, I can appreciate what he's saying. You know, I think that, um, you know, I, I can speak to feeling like concerned about, let's say for instance, if, I, if you feel a certain way, I think people are a lot more like computers than we, than we like to admit. And just because a lot of times I can't parse what's going on and why doesn't mean that it's not, it doesn't make sense. I see. Yeah. And, and I think that at least in the times of like, if I'm concerned about a situation or about a person or about something happening prior to the fight, or I'm like, there's a reason, there, there is a reason. I don't have to push that down and bury it. It's, there's a reason I'm like, why, what have I not thought about? What have I not done? What am I missing? Why am I feeling this way? As you mentioned, you know, for for yourself prior, like you'd be like, why am I feeling like this? And I don't do this very well in certain aspects of my life if I'm, now that I mention it or now that I think about it. But when it comes to competing, I think I do an all right job and I'm trying to learn to be better. And it's a, 
and going like, well, why do I, if I feel this way, there's a reason. Okay, am I thinking about this the wrong way? Have I not adequately prepared for something? I have to I have to address it. And then maybe I'll be up for four hours that night, you know, like extra hours thinking, like, what have I not addressed? Watching sparring, watching this, watching that. And then the, when I when I am thinking about things more more accurately or when I've addressed what that concern was, I feel any of that concern kind of dissipate. And I guess uh, if I honestly thought that you know, I guess when it comes to, I know I'm going to die at a certain point, obviously I'm going to get hurt. I'm going to, you know, pain happens, but the pain of loss would be nothing compared to the, or the pain of injury would be nothing compared to the pain of, of running away, you know? And, oh, yeah. and I, so I guess if I think about where's my value, what it's like, I'm, I feel like I'm a winner every single time I step into that ring and fight with everything that I have, I can't promise that I'll win my next fight. I know that I have the skills and the tools to beat anyone in grappling or in or in mixed martial arts at this point. It's just, I, I know that for certain. I know I've trained with enough people. I compete with enough people. I know I know where I stand, but I also know that I'm not perfect. And also the, the better fighter, even if I perceive that I was that thing, um, doesn't win on the night. The, the man who fights better wins on the night. And if I give credence in my mind to only the person that's, that's won has value versus going, what's your process? What's your path through this? How are you going about this? How are you thinking about this? How are you behaving? Then if, if I can focus on the process, then, then I will respect my opponent and I will respect myself and I'll respect anyone that behaves with, with a certain level of, of consistency to that. And they could win. There's plenty of winners in history that, that are shit bags. And there's plenty of losers that are not. But winning doesn't make you a bad or good person. And losing doesn't make you good by default either or bad by default. So, and I think that that can be the truth socially. That can be the truth, you know, athletically and, you know, a academically. So I guess- but Is I, there a primal fear though? Like a primal fear of getting hurt? The running away and- not facing the the threat long term is the bigger pain than any pain you can experience in yes. the fight. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. But what about the violence of? I mean, you don't have that on your face, but like uh, the, the I don't know if you've also seen Tyson talk about. He was on Rogan recently. And he was talking about. He was trying to psychoanalyze himself about why he enjoys violence so much. I mean, he called it orgasmic i don't know if, have you seen that clip uh, i haven't okay Should we're, we're playing we're, right. we're playing it because i can i need to because trump also retweeted it which is hilarious i don't know how to contextualize yeah that's an... that our president retweeted the clip of uh of, yeah, of, say, of tyson saying that's just maybe he's just doing the, like they're not gonna it's like i'm gonna throw him a curveball no one's gonna have any <laughs> idea what that is. but yeah he did no explanation just here you go there you go well, I think that's kind of like what you're describing. It's like if I give you an answer, it has to be a good one. Better to just let your imagination run. Exactly. Yeah, he's yeah, he's like the Kubrick of our time. <laughs> now, what's really interesting that sometimes, um, periodically, not real, but sometimes I struggle with the fact of why wow, the possibility I can really hurt somebody. Like you don't want to hurt them. What do you mean? But you struggle struggle with the possibility that you could hurt them. That is sometimes it's orgasmic. Sometimes, mm. yeah. Like some fights, like particularly like Tyrell Biggs or someone that you had problems with, someone that you Joe's not you, getting you had animosity towards. <laughs> so when you finally get your hands on them, hey, um, what does it mean, um? When fighting gets you, gets you erect, what does that mean? It's a good question. It means you're getting excited. Yeah. So that that's going through your mind right now. Well, that's how I get when I was a kid, and I, you know, sometimes this, I get the twinkle. The twinkle. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's like you reached a state as a human being, as a champion, as a ferocious fighter. You reached a state of of ability and of accomplishment that very few humans will ever, ever touch and feel. That's why I'm asking you, when you're running, when you're hitting the bag, when that heart's beating again, and you know who you are, you're Mike motherfucking Tyson. So when you're doing all this shit again, you're still Mike Tyson. Those thoughts have got to be burning inside you again. It's got to be pretty wild. I don't know. I, it's, um, 
it's wild, but I, um, I believe it's um, it's rightfully so to be that way. And I just know how to. Um, I don't think I, I masked it, but I just know how to deal with it. I don't let it overwhelm me. I mean, he goes on to try to. They don't ever like Joe doesn't bite. Well, the interesting thing about that conversation is Mike was trying to figure himself out. Yeah. Like he's trying spot. on the spot. Like, why do I feel this way? Uh, <laughs> is To me, it was like, to me, it's so real and honest to, uh, to feel like pleasure from hurting somebody. Like that, you rarely hear that. In this society, it's like you rarely like talk about like you feel pleasure from winning. You feel pleasure from like the relief of overcoming like all the stress you have to go through. Pleasure from just like the, the specifics of the fight, the techniques you use, the maybe overcoming being down a couple of rounds. But like how often do you hear somebody say, I just... In enjoyed he's not even saying because i hate the opponent he's saying like i enjoyed purely the violence of it that's crazy i mean i don't know it's honest it it I don't, it made me ask like i wonder how many of us are cognizant of that i'd say mike is uncommonly seemingly uh honest i think athletes make a full-time job out of lying <laughs> you know, I think people make a full time job. To themselves, job perhaps, too. That's fair. I mean, in some, you tell yourself or you tell others what you feel you need to, or maybe whether you whether even know what you feel you need to. But why should he not? I mean, again, he, did he did he run up and just hit somebody that didn't sign up for this? No, they, they signed up to be there. Well, that's the interesting thing about Dyson is there's that weird, uh, like, non-standard behavior. I mean... Like your fighting style is non-standard. He's non-standard to another degree of like, uh, who else has that? In jiu-jitsu, uh, uh, Polaris uh, oh, yeah. uh, uh, has this kind of weirdness. Like what's what's in there? Like there's a fear that I think uh, most opponents would have because it's like, it's no longer about like, it takes you out of the realm of its game. It takes us back to the thing we were talking about like before is it strips away that like several layers of Ryan Hall, the, the podcast uh, guest, Ryan Hall, the jiu-jitsu instructor, Ryan Hall, the jiu-jitsu competitor. It keeps going down to a point where like Ryan Hall, the murderer of all things that get in his way uh, that lies underneath all of it seemingly. Like if we're like in this society, we put all that aside, but it makes you wonder like now as society is being tested in, in many ways. It makes you wonder like what's underneath there. Well, uh, do we want do we want the answer to that? Because I guess it's what is it uh you seen Pulp Fiction, you know, the best character in the movie and in the best scene in the movie. It's like if my questions here if you're what do you call it? If my answer's scary, you should cease asking scary questions. Yeah. You know, and I guess uh you wonder I mean all of us, that's something that I think it's funny. We go, Oh, that's not okay. I mean, versus maybe not appropriate for situation X, Y, or Z. But uh, what should make any of us think? I mean, humanity is a different place now. And I mean, I'm not saying anything crazy out there, but humanity is a different place now than we were 5,000 years ago, where all of us are descended from people who have killed things with their teeth and fingernails in, in order to be where we are. And whether it was in, whether it was an animal or it was in conflict with another person, I mean, think about the, the chances of dying by violence now are so, so slim, at least in, in most countries and most places, like shockingly small, but th thankfully. But there was a period of time, like the most period of time where dying by violence was mostly how it went down. And I guess what would be facilitative, what would allow you to win back to Ender's game? You know, what allows you, if you can't do that, you are all, you are forever subject to people who can. And that's, that's a real thing. And, you know, we're fortunate to find ourselves in a situation where we don't, where other things matter. But that is a funny thing periodically where people, you'll see people like kind of jawing at each other, like in videos or out in the world that clearly neither of them expect this to get serious. Like, I'm just going to yell at you. You're going to yell at me. And it's like this weird LARPing thing. Where we're both going to go on our own separate way. <laughs> yeah. All it takes is one person to be like, well, I wasn't kidding. Yeah. And it's like, oh, you'll go to jail. I'm like, oh, I, I know. You're going to go to the morgue. And it's, that's, a, but that can happen like that, like society, I mean, obviously, anyway, you could jump across the table and stab me in the eye. 
I mean, I appreciate, I'd hope if you don't, and there will be consequences if you do, but not from, not from me, from, from the rest of society will potentially get you at a certain point, but you can decide to not play by the rules anytime you want. And it's fascinating that, yeah, that's, we've created rules based on which we all behave, but underneath there, you know, there, there's things that doesn't, the, there's motivations and forces that don't play by the rules. Oh, and it's sure. still there. Nature is metal is under the surface. Seriously. And again, I pull out my phone and I'm basically saying like, hey, I'm gonna, you're going to get caught. Yeah. But really, I'm further antagonizing you. Yeah. Rightly or wrongly. You know what I mean? Like, and that that's an interesting thing. And I, I feel like just people need to remember, any of us need to remember, just for any reason, just that's that's one step away at all at all times you ever i've had people say to me before like oh i don't feel safe i'm like you're not safe i kill you before you get out of this room nothing you do to stop that nothing i mean but don't worry you could do the same to me which means i'm like oh oh thank goodness can you imagine like how many guns are there are in this country like yeah. there, i mean everywhere i mean seriously everywhere yeah. but that's a heartening thought not the other way because people usually freak out and go oh my god gun violence gun violence like, gun violence is like really not a serious issue in the united states compared to what it could be because it means that i mean with the amount of guns and the amount of th bullets that are out there that are in circulation can you imagine if like one in every thousand was used in anger each day i mean this would be a terrifying place to live you couldn't go anywhere so i mean although you could say hey this is more than we'd like or xyz it actually means that people are much more reasonable and sane than than we're saying then or then I then sometimes I might I might argue. So I guess what I mean is like, oh man, I, I walked to Seven Eleven and I didn't get stabbed. I'm like, oh well, that's good because not because I protected myself with my karate. It's basically no one decided to run over and stab me because I wasn't protecting myself. It's I they they stopped. So I guess we're all fortunate to live in a society that that like you said, nature being metal doesn't become that big of an issue all the time. But it is funny when you get people in the ring and you go, hey, let's peel back from Mr. Tyson many layers of that and say, hey, now it's okay. And it's cool that, I mean, that's what society's doing. So I've, I lived in Harvard Square for a while mm. and we add extra layers of what safe means. Like now there's a dis discourse about safe spaces, about like ideas being violence or, or like, uh, you know, like, yeah, but ideas or minor slights against your personality being violence, but that's all, like extra layers around the nature is metal thing that uh, it's cool. That's, that's what progress is, but we can't forget that like underneath it is still, it's still the, the thing that will murder at the, at the drop of a, uh, in any, at any moment, if, uh, if aroused. One, one thing that I find funny though, or ironic maybe about the, uh, the, you know, words are violence, you know, offense is violence thing is that of course, that if that the belief in that then justifies my violence yeah. like my and whether maybe my maybe not physical violence but my response to my my aggressive response to things and i guess like which again begets begets a further aggressive response and, and like a you know kind of a, a tit for tat sort of situation or or it goes to like well there's 10 of me and there's one of you so we'll get you and you can't do anything about it but that's not morality that's that's just saying that's might makes right so I guess, again, you can understand why people do it. And there are certain, there is a progress aspect to it. But uh, again, I guess without proper examination, I'm effectively with my 10 friends, you know, and, and the force of the law, Mike Tysoning people, but not admitting to myself what I'm doing. And at least Mike Tyson, again, is honest. Are you uh, afraid of death? I mean, it's easy for me to say no, as I sit here, probably not about to die, but is this like the UFC question? Can you defeat any opponent? Exactly. The, the, answer, answer, is yes. the answer is, of course, yes. And uh, I don't have, they're not around, they're not here, are they? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, I mean, are you, uh, do you ponder your own mortality? Maybe another context to that is you mentioned two deaths for martial artists. I think that's actually why, honestly, even though at a, at a relatively young age, I think mortality is something that I'm aware of, more, maybe more than the average person. I think probably most athletes can speak to this, and anyone that's had. So I've managed to, to slide out of a couple near death experiences personally, you know, mostly river related, um, because I'm an idiot, but, um, I regret nothing, but, uh, yeah, and, yeah but, uh, thank God we're here. But, um, yeah, it, it is an interesting seeing, seeing the end and seeing going, well, what's going to happen. I, I guess, I, I think it comes back to kind of what we we're discussing about belief structure and belief system. I, I think a lot of times if I recognize that no matter what I do, it's all going to end one day. 
And then you go, well, why were we here? What would I do? Am, as, am I going to make it to 40? I have no idea. I'd like to hope so. I had no idea that I was going to make it to, to the age that I am now. Um, am I going to make it to 80? How much of that is in my control? much of it is not. I mean, we, we, it's so funny. It's an interesting, like back to the belief structure, again, like locus of internal and external locus of control, you know, what's facilitative versus what's true. And, you know, I think accepting personal responsibility for more than is on my control is, is probably a positive, but at the same time, recognizing that much of much is not in my control. I was fortunate enough to be born in the United States, fortunate enough to, you know, to not to knock on wood, have, have a serious disease that I'm not aware of right now. Um, I didn't do any of that. I just showed up. That was really fortunate. And I, I guess that doesn't diminish the fact that I've tried to make decent choices, but it works in concert with it. And I, I guess um, when I, when you go, is death what I want right now? No. No, I should think not. And again, it's easier for me to be relatively calm about it as I'm not staring it in the face. But what I would care a lot more about is, is how you live. That's what's in my control. And I can't control if as I walk out of this building, a helicopter falls on me. Worrying about that, I can't control. Maybe I, maybe I have cancer now and I don't know it. And I really hope not. But um, there's something about meditating on the fact that it could end today outside right. of your control that can uh, clarify your thinking about yeah the the fact that life is amazing like just kind of uh, yeah helping you enjoy this moment even if life was horrible let's say for instance it was it was you live at one of those times or places and those places still exist in this world today that life is brutal and metal and whatever all and short and painful would you still want it and again as i'm sitting here not not on fire physically it's easy to say yes but i would i'm confident i still i'll plant my feet and say yes any of li any life is amazing and beautiful and, and, a, and a gift, an unbelievable gift uh, with, that none of us have earned. <laughs> for the record, We're, I hate the word earned. A lot of times, earned, yeah, you earn, but it's like there's a lot of a lot of good fortune in earning, and that's back to do I want justice or do I want grace? And I guess we're all fortunate to be where we are, no matter where we are, and hopefully it should give us some sense of perspective, some sense of compassion for other people, but also, like like you said, a sense of peace. Where if it all ended right now, would I? be happy with what I, with a life to this point. I'm like, of course, would you like to live a little longer? Yeah, I would try to do more and try to live rightly to the best that I know how, which over time will hopefully continue to evolve in a, in a positive direction. But if the answer to that is no, I, I guess, uh, that's, that's always, that's a sign that, that what I'm doing is not what I'm meant to be doing. And I mean, you're familiar with the uh, Tecumseh before uh, so there's a, I've got one actually, if you could give me 10 seconds, I'll, I'll read this one out. This is a personal favorite, basically. And I, I think it sums up, I mean, again, I, it's one of those quotes on the internet, like when Abraham Lincoln said, don't believe everything you read online. Um, but uh, this is, you know, I, it's again, uh, attributed, but it's like, so live your life that the fear of death can never enter your heart. Trouble no one about their religion, respect others in their view and demand that they respect yours. Love your life, perfect your life, beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and its purpose in the service of your people. Prepare a noble death song for the day when you go over the great divide. Always give a word or sign a salute when meeting or passing a friend, even a stranger when in, when in a lonely place. Show respect to all people and grovel to none. When you arise in the morning, give thanks for the food and for the joy of living. If you see no reason for giving thanks, the fault lies only in yourself. Abuse no one and no thing, for abuse turns the wise ones to fools and robs the spirit of its vision. When it comes your time to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with the fear of death, so that when their time comes, they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way. Sing your death song and die like a hero going home. Powerful words. I don't think there's a better way to end it. Let me just say, uh, we've spoke maybe five, six years ago. I don't even remember when, but I'm not exaggerating saying like you had a huge impact on my life because of the podcast. You're the reason... I was doing the podcast as long as I have. You're the reason I'm doing this podcast. And it's a little, it's a stupid little meeting that you probably didn't know who I was. I didn't really know who you are. It was just like a magical moment. It's a flap of a butterfly wing kind of situation. And uh, yeah, I'm forever grateful. You're one of the most inspiring people in my life. So Ryan, it's a huge honor that you would come here, uh, Jen, and talk with me and waste all this time. I really appreciate it. It was amazing. 
Thank you so much, Lex. It's just been a pleasure. I really appreciate you having us on. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Ryan Hall. And thank you to our sponsors, PowerDot, Babbel, and Cash App. Please check out these sponsors in the description to get a discount and to support this podcast. If you enjoy this thing, subscribe on YouTube, review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, support on Patreon, or connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. And now let me leave you with some words from Frank Herbert in Dune. Deep in the human unconscious is a pervasive need for a logical universe that makes sense. But the real universe is always one step beyond logic. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.